Today is September the 25th, 2018. My name is Tanya Pincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University. And today I'm in the Stillwater Public Library to interview Willie Ann Lindsay Prada, along with her daughter, Birdie Diane Prada Neal. So thank you for coming today. Our topic is going to be uh, the Stillwater's African American Heritage Project. Uh, we're doing centers around Washington School and the neighborhood from years to go up until the current. So we'll try to cover as much as we can today. Um, let's begin with learning when and where you were born, Willie. Okay, I was born in 1941, October the 18th in Glencoe, Oklahoma. Okay, and Bertie, or do you want Diane? Which do you prefer? Either one. Okay. Um, I was born February 27th, 62 in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Okay. So in Willie, how many brothers and sisters do you, do you have? I have one, <laughs> one living sister, Elnora Sanders. Okay, and then how many siblings do you have? I have uh, five siblings, Okay. Uh, two brothers and three sisters. And where are you in the order? I'm the third child. So in the middle, kind of. Okay. We well, you know how that is, I'm middle too. <laughs> Okay, and uh, tell me a little bit about your parents, Willie. Okay, my parents was Willie Lindsay, and my mother was named Bertie Vic Lindsay, and uh, they lived, we lived here on 12th Street for many, many years, and my dad worked at a, a he was a custodian in a doctor's office, and my mother was a cook many, many years at OSU. Oh, okay. In a cafeteria or? Well, she worked in the, uh, one of those things called fraternity houses mostly. Okay. She, she got to hear lots of stories of it then. And they were, <laughs> they were Pentecostal and we were raised up. Okay. Church of God in Christ, they called those holy or holy rollers or whatever. And uh, that's where we were raised going to church all of our youth and school years. And where was the church? The church was on the corner of 11th and Hester. Church of God in Christ, it was called. And later they went ahead and put Lawson Temple, Church of God in Christ. And it just recently changed, just last week. And it is now a different church denomination, different minister. Same congregation though? Yeah, we had congregation. We had, I, Almost everybody in the neighborhood, they either went to the Baptist, Methodist, or the Church of God in Christ, okay. which was in close, they were within two blocks of each other. The Methodist was on 10th, off of 10th and Ramsey, and the Baptist was on uh, Knob Block and 11th, which was one block. Oh, this was before they moved up on 9th Street. But they just moved to 9th and Knob Block. So they just walked up there two blocks, <laughs> I guess. Not too far. Not too far. Well, you said you were born in Glencoe. What, what brought you to Stillwater? My parents moved to Stillwater. Uh, we were living rural, and uh, they were moving into town. So they moved into town. I guess Stillwater was considered a town then. <laughs> so so when they I moved into town for work, and as, as a... Uh, aged and got, they just wanted to move into town so they could get jobs. A little bit more convenient. Mm -hmm. Were your grandparents living in, in Glencoe? No, my grandparents were living uh, over in some of the rural area, but they wasn't really in, in Stillwater at that time. They did move here in later years. Okay. And where had they come from trying to tr trace back how did they come to be in, in Oklahoma? Do well, you know? uh, my grandparents, my dad knew, he came out of Mississippi, but his parents came out of Mississippi. Okay. And my mother's parents uh, were in Kansas. They came, uh, they were in Oklahoma, but they really relocated. Uh, and the way they tell it, they were in the great, uh, was that where they used? Migration. Migration from Mississippi into Memphis, Tennessee. From Memphis, Tennessee, they moved to Topeka, Kansas. Those people walked to Topeka, Kansas, 
and in T Topeka, Kansas, an uh, area called Little Tennessee, because all the people from Tennessee congregated in the same area, and my my mother's people were in that group. And what was her her maiden name? Her maiden name was Vic. Vic, okay. Bertie Vic. Okay. And her dad, once they located there, they decided they heard about Oklahoma and they heard about the Indians, and her dad went from Topeka, Kansas down to Meridian, Oklahoma to see if it was okay for them all to move down there because it was two big families and they both had 19, 20 kids. And my uh, granddad, my mother's dad, walked to Meridian, Oklahoma and lived there a while with the Indians and visit. And then he went back and told them it was good and they all came down to Meridian, Oklahoma. And uh, Horace Vick was in the Oklahoma Land Run. Okay. In Meridian, Oklahoma. Well, that's quite a walk from Topeka to... It's quite a walk. Yeah. Quite a walk. Mm -hmm. And those people were, you know, they had been slaves and so they were free and they, you know, a lot of them didn't read and write and, uh, but they had good understanding. They knew how to make a living knew how to work the grounds. Mm -hmm. They know how to plant a garden and, you know, survive. They, su they were survivors. Did they uh, have to grow cotton and pick cotton along the way, or do you, do you know? I'm they didn't Oklahoma, necessarily sure. grow cotton, but they did uh, pick cotton. Okay. And we did that in Stillwater even. Really? Yes. Yeah. They, uh, there were families that came in. They would come in on a truck, and if you wanted to go to the field, you could get on that truck and that and go to the cotton field with them. Pick cotton. Oh, and did you? Did you? Yeah, we did. did we you? didn't have to do, get on it, but we did get on it at times. And because it was along with work, it was playful because it was always a pond wherever the field was at. It was a pond close by. And after dinner, the kids just went and played mostly, swam. I mean, uh, we laugh about it because sometimes if you didn't have money to stop a, a food to take, he would, uh, the man would give you money to get something at the store so you could have dinner. And some, uh, my sister was one, barely picked enough to pay the man back for lunch. And we used to laugh about that all the time. She really didn't quite pick enough to pay the man back because, you know, you they waited. And, uh, probably was 50 cents a hundred or something like that. Uh, that's the way I remember it anyway. That, you know, it didn't pay a whole lot. It paid an, enough for you to survive on. Enough to do it. Yeah, and people did it because it was money. It was work, but it was money. And some of those people had a goal and they made sure that they picked amount to meet their goals, what they were going for. And did they watch the kids to make sure that they were not it really? No. Okay. You know, that you just you just learn by reputation and stuff and uh, we it was always uh going down one seventy seven going into Perkins, it was always you owned those fields over there and they always had cotton. And I was teasing my brothers one day and I said, Well, well which would you rather do? Pick chop or pool? <laughs> He said, well, I think I would rather chop. And I said, well, I don't want to do any. <laughs> and we, we had fun laughing about it. But that was a way for uh, people to see cotton. Because the, as the fields fell out, you know, they just stopped. Oh, it's used to have fields down there. They're pretty when they're all white. Yeah, that's all they are. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and what's the difference between picking and pulling? Well, if you are picking, you're pulling the cotton out of that hub. Huh. And if you are if you are pulling, you pull the whole bowl. Oh, okay. And if you're chopping, you're thinning out the rows. All of it sounds like it's not too much fun. Well, it's work. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you if you're pulling your fingers, you you could easily get scratched and whatever with those bows because they were sharp on the ends. When would you have to watch for snakes in the, in the rows? Not really. 
No. That's what I would be worried about. <laughs> no, we didn't. In fact, uh, most most of the people that planted cotton, they plant watermelons in, in with it down the rows. And, you know, there were many times people would stop and open up a watermelon and people would come and eat watermelons. You know, they just, they fix, uh, they just knew what to do. And how early would they start? Early. Early. The man would pick us up. It would be day, it would be daylight, but we'd have to travel for miles sometimes to go to the land. And then work till dark or? They, we would work till, till that you had to stop when you start getting dust on because then we'd get home. Mm. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of people went to the cotton field. One time we went, it was uh, Thanksgiving, I'll never forget that. The man came into town and I guess all over, everybody was having a hard time and he really needed to uh, get the fields picked and in and because his family was hurting and uh, the men in the neighborhood got together and discussed and decided that even though it was Thanksgiving, we didn't need to lose that day. We needed the money, our families needed it and that family needed it. And so the women got together and they packed up Thanksgiving dinner and we went to the field, to the cotton field. And then we stopped for like two, three hours and they spread out big tablecloths, which was like big sheets and put out all this food and everybody just stopped and had Thanksgiving. We were out in the field. That was probably one of your favorite memories then. Well, I, I just remember that because people got along and there was no misunderstanding. And they said, well, the, the cotton owner, he needed, his family needed that income. And the pickers needed that income. And even though it was Thanksgiving, you know, it was in November and we were having snow sometimes and stuff. And so they said, we're not gonna waste this day just being home. We can, let's just go so we can survive. So the ones that picked cotton, they just got on those trucks and went to the fields and our parents took Thanksgiving dinner. And I was very young because I asked my brother, why was the stalks so high? And he said, well, you were so young and Billy that they just, you know, the stalks were as tall as I was. So you go through the fields, he said. It, they really wasn't that high. It was just that we were little. Well, they trusted you not to run off and get into too much mischief. It wasn't nowhere to run off to to get into <laughs> mischief even. I mean, those kids would ask. It usually was the boys, and they would say, "Well, where's the where's the ponds at?" And the and the owner would say, "You know, well, it's a pond so many," and they would go down there and swim. Nobody thought of any danger in there. I just did, and anybody that wanted to go went. But you know, the adults were adults, and so they wasn't going off. They came, they did what they came up there to do. <laughs> but they knew we were kids, and they let us do that. Well, I guess there were enough adults to watch at some point to where what kids were doing. Well, so they knew we just went to the field, and they, these people were just so trustworthy, you know. You know what you could do and what you couldn't do. At that time, anybody could chastise you or tell you. In fact, they, if you were somewhere, they would say, does your mom and dad know you're here? What are you doing here? Why are you in this in this neighborhood or whatever? You know, we just, we stayed in the neighborhood. Okay. And the neighborhood would be from what? From, from mainly, to me, it was from over on 14th, because some people live down by, we call it the old port, which is all the way down West Street. It's a real nice park down there. Well, it was a park. It had a swing and a slide, and uh, that's where we used to go. We called it the Black Point at that time. And people lived going down West Street right to that, up to that point. And uh, people could, could tell other people's kids. You just, you just didn't, our neighborhood was from over there on 15th to up to 9th. We usually didn't cross 9th Street. Okay. We had stores and uh, things in our neighborhood. 
And then the other direction from Pont Duc to Probably up to almost uh, to Duck or over to Duncan. Okay. Seemed like it was some families just right over on Duncan. And then it was another little place over by where UPS is at now. Mm -hmm. It was a block in there where some blacks lived, right in that block over there. And then how far west would, would West I Street be the last? I don't remember going past Adams. But it was always, seemed like nobody ever really left home if, before they moved, they would move from the front house to the back house. It was always a house behind a house. And no, it's like your grandparents stayed there, your uncles or people aged and they didn't go anywhere, they just stayed right there. And I don't even know, did they have rest homes back then or what? It's not, I don't remember Hardly anybody not. going, being put in a rest home. Took care and of I, and the, I remember my mother going to sit with different families to help take care of different sick people that were there. And they were always older people. And uh, my dad and mom would go and do different things to help the families out. Sounds like it was a tight knit community. It was. It, was. it really was. Well, where did you go to elementary school? I went to elementary school at Washington School right on 12th and between Knob Rock and Hempstone 12th Street. Started with first it was grade. Called West, it was called Washington School. Yeah, I started first grade. And, and my mother had to work. And my sister, when she started, she was really too young to be in the first grade. But the teacher told my mom to bring her on down. And so my sister went to school younger than what you're supposed to be going to school. And the teachers were considered of different families and what they needed, and they did accordingly. About how many were in your class? Well, I'll tell you when you at this school you graduated from the eighth grade to the ninth, and I took my eighth grade graduation picture to work with me one day to show, and one of the girls said, "Well, where's the other kids at? Where, where's the rest of this picture at?" Uh, you know, right? And I'm like. Well, that was it. And she said, well, there's only like 12 people on here. Well, my mother saw we were in the eighth grade. And we, the eighth grade marched with the 12th grade at graduation. Okay. And they did that at Washington School all the years that I can remember. Of course, I was in the 10th grade when we integrated. Okay. But I went to Washington School from elementary and junior high to the 10th grade. And they integrated, and the seniors went, one year the seniors went, the next year the seniors and the juniors went, and the next year was the seniors, the juniors, and the sophomores. And I was a sophomore when we went to the high school, and it was right up at the community center. And what was it called at that time? It was called Stillwater Junior High School. Stillwater. It was called Junior Stillwater High School. I graduated from there. From the community, it was the community center was the high school. Okay. At that time. And what year did you graduate? In 1959. Was that transition hard, switching from? Well, Washington. It wasn't State. hard for me because we were so close to our neighborhood. We walked to school. I felt sorry for my sister because I had a young sister, and uh, when she went to school, they walked. To where the high school's at now from the neighborhood by Washington School. We were all around Washington School in that neighborhood. And they had to walk to school. And even years later, when my kids went, if you were within a mile of a school, you couldn't ride the school bus to another school. And so we were close to Lincoln School. And so we had to drive our kids to whatever school. We, we chose Westwood, so all my kids went to Westwood Elementary. And you had to drive them. We had to drive them. And they had to walk home some days, but they never had to walk to school. We'd have to cross uh, 6th Street then. Was it as busy as it is It now? wasn't as busy. When the, uh, the streets wasn't as busy. I don't even remember if 6th Street was even there. Sure I wasn't four lane, I guess. <laughs> no, okay. no. But they walked and they, you know, it was a group of them. They was, it was never just one person anyway, <coughs> because other kids in the neighborhood, their parents drove them. And was Westwood first through what? Six was it, I think. That was uh, 
Westwood was. It seemed like it was through the fifth or sixth grade. First through the. Because they fifth, had. A, because we had sixth, seventh, and eighth grade was junior high. And, and junior high was at the community center yes. at that time. Well, we had classes there, but we also had classes here. Yeah. The, oh, the school this was okay. in, uh -huh. Yes, in, in this building because you would, some classes you would walk from there down to here. Yes. And the kids did it. I mean, it was nobody cutting out and saying, I'm going on home or I'm going, mm -hmm. you know, kids just did what they were told to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. And then they, I don't even remember that they had teachers standing out to watch the kids walk down here. They just knew they had to. I'm just I, I think they had a few. It wasn't a lot, but I think it was a few. I do know that the swimming pool was down here because the ones that was having swimming and stuff, they came down here for that. This building had a swimming pool? The school. The school did. Hmm. Yeah, this building was not here. The, yeah. This is the new library that was built. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was half. The school was split. Okay. And they, and even now, you know, they talked about buying the houses between the community center and here. And I get tough because I thought, well, man, if that would have been needed, they could have did something that way back then, you know, at the schools closer, those two points closer. Mm -hmm. Because uh, they had shop down here. The assistant principal, when I worked at the Stillwater High School, Frank McLean was uh, assistant principal, and he taught down here at this school. And Cleo McGorry had taught down here at this school. And, that uh, name I recognize. You never recognize that name, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what year did you graduate from high I, school? I graduated May of 1981. And it would have been Stillwater High at that time? Well, the school, at one time it was C.E. Donard High School. Yes. Okay. And it changed to Stillwater High School. While so, you were there or after? Uh, I think it changed to Stillwater High School either my sophomore or junior year, because my sister, she graduated from C. Donor High School. And that's what I graduated from. That's what it was called, C. E. Donor. Yeah. Well, once you graduated, what did you do? Once I graduated, I was already married. I got married in March, March 15th of that year. So I was actually married when I graduated. So my husband went to the prom with me and to the, you know, and then I, I went to work, got a job, started having a family. Mm -hmm. My husband had a job, and we lived in Stillwater, but we lived, we lived with my mother for a while. Mm -hmm. And finally, we could rent a house. You know, and that's that's just what everybody did. Seemed like you know, you either got married or you you went to work, or the boys had jobs or they went in service. Mm -hmm. So had your husband graduated from? My husband was from Texas. He wasn't from here. He knew nobody. Uh, well, then how did you two meet? They, I went to a rodeo, the first rodeo I had ever went to in Drumright, Oklahoma, and met him. And oh. those men had came up from Texas, and they called it the Black Circuits, and they went to the black towns, and they had rodeos. And Drumright wasn't considered just one of the black towns, but this is the man put on the rodeo there and those men went. But they did go to a lot of the black towns here in Oklahoma. Bowley was one, they had big rodeos in Bowley, they went to Langston, they went They went to different towns and uh, they were black towns and they had rodeos. And the men from Texas came up and put on the rodeos. And how did your parents take that news? Well, they let me go, you know, with my girlfriend pleading as my mom the last, and, her stepdad was relative to my mother, so she let me go with them over to drum right. And that's where I met him. And so... Uh, well, what was he doing in the rodeo? Was he he was a bull rider. Bull rider, okay. Yeah. Most of those men rode horses and bull riding and a buck, uh, what do they call them? Bucking horses they rode and uh, calf roping and just the normal thing they wrote to us do now. They did back then. Well, after you got married, did he continue to do that? No, he got a job and he worked 
at different places here in Stella, mostly at the car places. How did you how did you talk him into moving here? There just was no choice. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I couldn't move to Texas. I couldn't leave my family. <laughs> and he was, you know. He came. He was already used to traveling if he was well, traveling around. With I told him, I, we were riding each other, and I told him that all the girls at the high school uh, were engaged or were getting married. And he sent me an engagement ring. <laughs> so, through the mail, huh? Through the mail. So I was engaged. And then he came to, and you know, I had. Uh, told him I was older than I was and that I was a senior and I was just a junior. And he came up and my mother told him I couldn't get married because I was just a junior. And I had to graduate from school first. I had to graduate. Because you just had to graduate. I mean, that was just a rule. You knew you had to graduate. So he my mother, my mother just, you know, they just insisted if you were in school and why would you stay in school till you get to be a sophomore or junior and not go ahead and finish? And almost all the girls that didn't finish, they went back and got the, they didn't call it GED then, I don't know what it was called, but they all uh, graduated, some went on to college and, you know, it was just, it was just expected of you. The education was important. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who, some of your teachers? I remember all of my teachers. Uh, one of them, uh, the teacher was uh, Miss Johnson, Ruth Johnson. She lived here for until she deceased. And uh, Miss Clay was a teacher here. Our coach was Mr. Watkin. And the, the team, Mr. Watkin was the football basketball coach. That's what we had at school. And he was friends with the coaches at the white school. And Mr. Lopez began to bring his boys down to some of the basketball games and the football games. And at our school, the homemade girls always, they cooked a meal after the game and fed the players. And Mr. Lopinem got comfortable with that and the boys. And you know, that was something different for them. And their friends even now with a lot of those boys that came down to Washington School. Did they play each other? They didn't exactly play each other, but they, they were friends. Scrimmaged, maybe. And uh, even Mr. Loper, he had a he had recruited a boy. I think that uh, he the guy came from Arkansas. His family moved here, and he played for the Stillwater High School. But eventually, those those games got forfeited because it was against a rule. Like he moved the whole family here so that boy could play for Stillwater High School. He was tall and. You know, he, he, I remember that, and they and they talk about it a lot of time. We had Washington School reunion still. Every two years, they have Washington School reunion. Well, we, I, mean, I take it you were in the home act. If, did you help cook? Well, you, yes. Uh, you, we made during the year we made candy and different uh, different uh, breads and stuff and. That was required. You had to know, ma learn measurements and cook, and you had to learn how to sew. And uh, you got a, a, some licks if you cut your material wrong. <laughs> you know, they just didn't hesitate because your mom them had spent money buying that material, and you had to learn how to cut. You, and you didn't cut on the fold. I know that to this day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. You learned the girls had homemaking. A few boys had homemaking. Then they had a, a show, and they would show off. We would model our clothes that we had made, and some boys took homemaking. A couple of them took homemade, made pajamas and stuff, and they modeled. But they couldn't get a lot of boys to take homemaking. And I think even to this day, uh, working at the Stillwater High School, I remember the teacher saying she couldn't get, she tried to get my grandson to take some classes and he wouldn't. They just don't do that. Some of them can sew, but I think they're learning that at home, <laughs> how to thread a needle and sew. Sometimes, sometimes they can sew better than us girls. <laughs> the guys. Yeah. 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 But it was, it was a fun time and you, you don't miss what you had until you miss it, until it's gone.
You said you got licks though, if you if you yeah, came. you got you know you would get licks if you had been spanked or yes, what? yes, wow, yes. There were different things you got licks for, and it wasn't a, a, a shame or a disgrace or anything because you know you didn't want to get a lick. I mean, people knew all the kid other kids knew because if you most homes if you got a lick at school you got one at home because they backed up those teachers. Mm -hmm. The parents said, you know, if they had to get, you had to be doing something to get a lick and they just weren't gonna have it. So you got a lick at home. Well, did you ever on the receiving end of one of those? Not exactly, no. <laughs> no, because our parents were so firm on uh, respecting your elders and, you know, the what I did get a lick for, I, the store was about three blocks from my house, and I would walk to the store. And in the summer, a lot of people sat out in the yards, and you had to give those people the time of day when you pass. And one day I passed, and I said, "Well, I spoke to him, and I'm, you know, if you found a penny, you'd run down to the store." And so I said, "I'm, I'm tired of speaking to them," and I passed by like I didn't see him. And that evening, my dad said, "So." You was Miss Uppy the other day, huh? You just uh, didn't give those people the time of day. You had to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You just had to do it. And so I got a spanking for that. I, I had best give those people the time of day when I passed by. <laughs> well, that, those same set of uh, rules, for lack of a better word, did you apply them to your children? Yeah. They, they spoke mm -hmm. to yes. They had and they said yes. We said yes, ma'am yes, and no, ma'am. Ma no, ma Our kids said it, and yes, our sir, grandkids, because no, most grandkids stayed with you sometime or another, and it got so that people didn't want kids saying that to them. You know, they wanted you to call them by the first name and not say yes, ma'am and no, ma'am. You know, my my son had a teacher and. And he said, well, she said I didn't have to call her, you know, by her uh, Miss So and So. And I said, yes, you do. I'm telling you, you will call her by the correct name. You're not going to be on a first name basis with your teacher because it's your teacher. Okay. And, and the times listen. have changed. Because that's for sure what some of them don't call them. <laughs> and he would say, uh, yes, ma'am, and the teachers would, you don't have to say, yes, ma'am, that makes me feel old. And I told my son, and I also told the teacher, yes, he will continue to do that. That's a respect thing, and he's going to do that. Okay. Well, that's good. And did you teach? already have a sew? Are to a sure? certain extent, okay. yeah. Yeah, because you learn that at home too. You have to learn how to thread a needle and sew. And my boys can thread a needle and sew. In fact, as I age, they had to thread the needle for me sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they, they can sew because they might not always have a woman around to do that. My boys could cook as good as my girls and iron based clothes as good as the girls could. Because I had two boys along with four girls and you know, they had to they had to learn how to do that. They had to learn how to wash because they didn't grow up like I grew up. When I grew up, the water line didn't come down our street. So we packed water and we were so glad when it finally came and the closest it got to us was on the corner of Jefferson and 12. And we were right on the corner next to the woman that had a uh, hacking. But for years, we packed wash water by the tubs up to our house. And that was like two blocks away almost. We didn't think anything about it. That we just didn't have water line come up to our street. We didn't have lights. The closest light, street light, was on 9th and Jefferson. And it would just get so dark. 
you know. But I, we had been taught we could go places. But my mother was a firm believer that the devil was at his business after 12. So wherever we were at, whatever we were doing, before 12 o'clock we were headed to the house and trying to get in the door to beat that devil. <laughs> and we grew up believing that for years. And that's a good thing to do though, because with crime like it is now, the devil's at his business, but, but a lot of bad things happen after dark. 12 midnight or 12 noon? 12 midnight. midnight. Okay. 12 midnight. And we weren't nowhere but in the neighborhood. But when you get to dancing, you know, that's all kids were going to dance. And it was a few Duke Johnson, the kids all would hang out and go to. My mother let us go. But uh, just on the weekends, you know, you stayed out a little later on a Friday night or Saturday night. And but my mother would always say, you know, if you and she didn't believe in kids spending the night, and we didn't spend the night anywhere but at home. And kids didn't spend the night with us, and we didn't spend the night in other homes. My mother would say, at night when it started getting dark, you be smart as the birds. When it's time to go to bed, every little bird is in its own nest. <laughs> and we so went. Sometimes go to bed, we were in our own little nest. <laughs> and she didn't let anybody else be in that nest. She sent all the kids home. Some kids wanted to spend the night, but only a few close, close relatives spent the night. And we didn't spend anywhere, but we, we spent days with our grandmother one time. But when my dad got off work, he stopped by and got us on the way. When he got off work on the way home, which was probably four or five o'clock in the evening. And we went home. Well, what do you think the reason was for that? She just wanted you to make sure you were safe? Or? I don't know, but uh, I guess she was grew up that way. They didn't spend the night around. Well, didn't, were you that way with your children? Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. And I was that way with my husband. I didn't, okay. I couldn't be that way with my grandchildren because my kids found their own beliefs and reasons and so their kids could whoever they want to stay with, you know, they could go stay with. But it didn't pan out to be the best way to do it. Uh, I just feel like to, even to this day, if you have a home and you have your own bed, why wouldn't you want to stay in your own home and in your own bed? Well, in mine, I know how I raise my kids and know how I was. And I didn't know about the other people's homes and how they did with their kids and how they trained their kids and stuff. So mine, they could go to parties and stuff there, but they stayed home. Okay. Not that you didn't hear about it from people. Because <laughs> some of them would tell me, well, her kids, she would say, the woman told me, she said, well, they came to the party and, uh, but when it came time for them to go to bed, their mom came pick them up. And so she, she didn't let those two kids, they didn't stay the night. And they almost couldn't sleep somewhere else. Well, when you're raised like that, you almost couldn't sleep somewhere else really. And, and everybody's not the same. All, the, all parents aren't the same. You know, some kids, uh, they, we just stayed. We grew up in the summer, it'd be so hot, we'd sleep outside. My mother would sleep outside with us. Everybody would be out in the yard sleeping. They'd bring the beds outside and we'd sleep outside, it'd be so hot in the house. And nobody thought it was wrong or anything because you could hear talking over in the other yard sometime and you know they were outside sleeping too. And that house, basically they, everybody did the same things in our neighborhood. We had a, a really good neighborhood, really good. No, you felt safe in your neighborhood. Really, it was really, uh, because everybody raised everybody. And you hear that word, people say, take a village to raise a child, it take a village. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the means is the same for everybody, 
In fact, I didn't know anybody in our neighborhood that didn't go to ch one of those churches. Come Sunday morning, everybody was at a church. I didn't know anybody that didn't go to church till I got grown. I didn't know they had some bootleggers or some, <laughs> I didn't know that stuff was in the neighborhood because I didn't know about it. You didn't hear about it. Kids didn't hear their parents talking or the women would be talking. Kids had to go play. Nobody was listening or trying to hear what the adults were saying. You just didn't do that. You had to go. You, you went and played. They didn't talk in front of you, discuss stuff. You didn't know what went on in Sally Sue's house and all that. You just didn't know all that stuff. And kids just do know everything now. So there were bootleggers in the neighborhood? Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, what were some of the other businesses in the neighborhood that you recall? Well, we had grocery stores. We had uh, women that baked cookies and they sold cookies. My kids could tell you every house that had a candy bar or a cookie <laughs> or whatever. Miss Lucy, she did popcorn and, balls. So. Uh, they had, uh, they, we had Jude Johnson, was just for the kids. And the, the woman was so nice and she would, we would go knock on her door and go, we, we want to dance. And she would just hand us the key. We could go over there and put a nickel in the jute box and, you know, and just have fun. It was just, it was just a fun thing. But on a Sunday evening, when it came time for our youth stuff at our churches, everybody was going across that field that's down there now called the park. Everybody was headed to one of those churches that evening because it was a trail that went through that park and everybody left about it now because all the kids was either going to that Methodist or that Church of God in Christ or uh, Mount Zion, which Mount Zion has been Mount Zion for a long time now. Right. But Church of God in Christ was there. Well, what was the name of the place that they were coming from? Did it have a name? They just didn't have a name. We just knew them. We just called them by the people that owned them, those buildings. Because, okay. you know, we would say we're going out Miss Lucy's or we're going Miss Elena's or, uh, you know, we just called them by those people's names. And they knew. Then we had a big deal in the park that was called the wreck and people would have functions in there. Mm -hmm. And kids would always go there. Were there any eating places in the neighborhood? Yes, there was many eating places. But because the people uh, cooked, most homes cooked mm -hmm. and stuff, you know, it was eating places though that people went to. I mean, if you wanted a hamburger go or something, it was eating places, yes. Well, did you go in, venture into town very often? In the On a Saturday, we would go uptown if you needed to get something from uptown. And we usually went in pairs when we went to town. Me and my sisters, we usually went together. We usually was just going to get some powder or pantyhose or whatever. I don't think it was pantyhose in just stockings. Or and uh, we could we went uptown. Not like we were just going shopping, had a list going shopping uptown. We just going to get a certain thing. <laughs> we could go to the show, and we my, we would go to the show on a Saturday and stay all day watch it over and over. Now they don't even show it back to back at the shows. You know, you pay and go in for that sad. And then, but back then when the show ended, it started over again. We sat and watched the same cowboy show about two, three times. And Mama would come get us and she would, uh, she would clear out the show. We sat upstairs and kids would try to be hiding and she'd go knock on the door where the man was running the movie and she'd say, I need you to turn the lights on. <laughs> All the kids. <clears throat> she said, your mom wants you, you need to be at home. It's, it's getting dark. It's time for you to go home. And she cleared out the show. She brought everybody back to the neighborhood. Walking, I guess. Yeah, we walk. walk. Uh -huh. Some of those kids said mean things about our mom, but <laughs> she, my mom didn't care. She strutted us right on down, <laughs> right on down to the neighborhood. And she said it was, everybody needed to be in the neighborhood when it got dark. And it was a zest hose over there on 6th Street. Uh, what's that now? Kentucky Chicken. It, one time that was where the ice cream was at. And we'd walk up there on Sundays to get an ice cream cone. And that was just something fun to do because, you know, people made ice cream at home. They had ice cream. Almost everybody knew how to make ice cream. 
can't do late. But that was just a fun thing to do on a Sunday afternoon, walk up there to get an ice cream cone. That was not outside of the night. Nine. It was outside, but that's the one place you could uh, go to. And then we would sneak on up to the student union because they had an elevator. And we would ride the elevator. We would sneak up to the student union, get on the elevator, and then we'd laugh all the way back home because we thought we then got away with time. Because <laughs> we would ride the elevator. And I think now my kids go, elevator? See, my kids, they watched that movie, Miss Jane Pittman, and when she was in that station and she drank from the water fountain. Well, my kids was looking at one another for like, well, what was, what was so big about me? She just took a drink of water. <laughs> you know, they just didn't get it for a long time. I had to explain what was happening to them. You know, because they were going like, well, goodness, she just took a drink of water. I don't know what they thought she was going to do with the water fountain. <laughs> you just, that's all that it was fun was get a drink of water. But uh, that's what we, that's, that's the way we grew up. And everybody was close, all the, all the kids. And they, at the reunions, a lot of the people come back from other states. They come back for the Washington School reunion. Because that was a part of their childhood that they remembered and loved. It was, it was a fun time. Well, do you recall having separate freaking fountain, fountains in, in Stillwater? In your, yes, at the bus station. The bus station was, at one time, the bus didn't come into Stillwater. You had to get uh, uh, go down to the Nine Mile Corner, whatever they call it, going to what Perkins. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, it wasn't in the town of Perkins, because Perkins is like two, three miles on over, but the bus stopped it right there at 177, 33, that's where, and people would go out there to pick up whoever was coming in Stillwater. The bus didn't come in Stillwater for a long time when I was little and young. And uh, when it did come, where did the bus came? You know, like you're in the cities and you can pull a deal and get off close to the street you need to get up on. Well, that bus went straight to the bus stop. It was over there on Lewis for a long time. And that's where the bus station was. And the water fountain, and the, and the, uh, uh, it was it was different. I remember when integration came, it was a jewelry store called, uh, I don't know if it was called Leonard's back then, but it was a jewelry store and in the back, was where they cooked hamburgers. And we went through the alley to that door and ordered hamburgers. And one day we went there and the lady said, you all can come in the front door now and order. You don't have to come back here to order anymore. And you remember that? I remember that. And I remember when it was a five and dime on Main and they had a, a eating place in there. The blacks couldn't sit, you could go in there and buy something but you couldn't sit at the counter. And I remember when they had the set-ins and the kids that were seniors at the school set in up there at that five and dime. Some people came from, I guess, Oklahoma City or Tulsa, I think they came from Oklahoma City, and they warned the people not to, uh, it was close to Christmas in, in the winter, and they warned the people not to buy. Don't spend your money downtown. Do not spend, it was in a Tasco on the corner and a five and dime and cats. And they said, don't spend your money. And that's when we got a shoe for the year. We I, we got a pair of shoes. And and my dad, my mom didn't go with us. For some reason, she always sent my dad. And you had a choice of two colors and you could get them buckled up or laced up. And they were always high top. And you couldn't wear the soul out on them. <laughs> I don't care how much water you walk through, you never wore those shoes out. But that's that's how they did it. And my mother probably did that on purpose, you know, she didn't want to hear us whining about what kind of shoe we wore and stuff. And my dad was just no nonsense. He was like, okay, here's your choice. You want these brown ones or these green ones? You want to buckle up or the lace up? <laughs> At least you had a choice. Yeah, you had a choice, <laughs> but they never wore out. And they had to last a year. They until last that year. Yeah. What if your foot grew in that time period? It didn't. 
because they didn't get it to just match your foot. They get they they I left one there. room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are smart people. Yeah. And then hand me down. But when they when they when the people didn't go down there and shop and buy that year, and everything opened up, it was like okay, integration is here. Was it called Skeets? Skeets on the ninth. Ninth of May was a, cap, a cafeteria there named Skeen. And in later years, that's where I took all my kids at graduation. We'd go down there and eat a meal at Skeen's cafeteria because we didn't eat out a lot in cafeterias. You know, we ate at home because we didn't have funds for that. But at that graduation, the night of the graduation, that evening, we'd all go down to Skeen's and we would treat our kids for eat out, teach them how to eat out. <laughs> Do you remember that? Not really. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was called Ski. And now they, they painted something on that wall. If you go down ninth on that building, it's got, you know, somebody went down there and painted a mural and they had old cars and like the Just bread, the bread man, because they delivered bread back then. It was stuff to mother come around selling bread and uh, ice cream or ice. I remember the ice man. And then he would chip off ice, and we would follow the truck all over the neighborhood. And he would chip off little pieces of ice, and we would hold it to eat ice. And we thought that was so great. <laughs> Just getting a piece of ice. And he would chip off ice. And they had an ice place. It was on Washington and 6th Street. It was a, a they, you could, some people, what do they call it when they have they meat, do meat, and they would have it down there. Me Walker. Uh -huh. yeah. They had meat lockers and people kept meat down there. And not we didn't because my mother cooked everything Papa brought in the door, but uh, you know, it was there. But it was ice also. We could go down there and buy, you could buy a big block of ice because people had that in the refrigerators up at the top. I don't know how that ice stayed so long. It seemed like it stayed lasting a long time. But I know that they bought big blocks of ice because Mama did. And the milkman would come by, you know, they delivered milk, and you sit your balls out, and he would leave that many, and uh, people had accounts, and Mama had an account. And my sister got brave one day and ordered ice cream for all of us. <laughs> but that, it was, that, everybody was raised, seemed like the same way. Well, did she have chickens? Yeah, my mother raised chickens. Uh huh. She raised chickens, we learned about that. Uh, she, Cause sometimes she would have the oven door open and her and my dad would discuss, you know, chickens. And they sold chickens at uh, the TGNY store. They were colored chickens at Easter time. They always had colored chickens. Of course, those chickens would grow up and you see them running through the yard. Some of them would have red on them and yellow on them and, you know, steel green on them and stuff. And eventually, you know, they got cooked. And nobody was crying saying, Mama don't cook because all we could see was that <laughs> that fried chicken was good. The end result. Uh, <laughs> my mother raised chickens. Did she have a method to harvest them? Yes, she knew when. My mother could read the almanac and tell people. My mother, they had people in the neighborhood that could do some of anything and everything. And people went to them for certain things and when to plant them. And they would tell you, and the neighbor woman, she might would holler over, Barry, you know, so storm's coming, can you tell? It's way off, but it'll be here in three or four days. And it would be a storm would come through, a dust storm or a rainstorm or whatever. They just, they knew all that stuff. I think it was inherited and bred it in them. People came to my mother, my mother would read the almanac to see uh, whatever the horoscope was, uh, if it was a good time for them to have a tooth pull or surgery or whatever. My mother would read that in the almanac and tell them what it said. And my dad taught himself how to read and he started by reading the Bible. And he started in Genesis, reading the Bible. Sounded out those letters, he learned the letters and how to sign them out and read. He was a deacon in the church. He gave lessons. 
my mother was the church mother for years till she deceased in 86. Good role model. She was the, she was the church mother for the pastor and when he turned it over to his son, she was the church mother for his son. Because they said the church mother people confided in her and she didn't gossip or talk their whole business to anybody. It just went to God, from them to her, from her to God, and she didn't discuss stuff. And we never heard what she said to people and talked to people, because we we had to go play when somebody came over. We didn't we didn't hear grown ups talking, whether they were crying or laughing or whatever. We it was not our business. <laughs> So, but now kids, and they join in with their parents talking grown up stuff. What do they know about what your bills are and what you're gonna pay and how, how much you make? You know, they don't, but they hear all that, know all that, and they're blabbing in and everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to all their friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a difference. But you know, sometimes you can't tell people how to raise their kids. It's, it's pretty, pretty, it's a sad situation to us. Well, what else did the church mother do? I haven't heard that term. What else did she, was she just a confidant? No, the church mother uh, put on, she said what the other women should be doing in the church to help the church, help the neighborhood. They, they did dinners, they sold plates. Uh, I don't know how many times I went up to Strokes Funeral Home to the Bernhards, and my mother would be having a big dinner coming up, selling dinners, and take our desk up there to Mr. Bernhard. Mama would sit this in here, and by God, they couldn't say they didn't have the money because my mother would run it down to them how many funerals there had been in the neighborhood and what she expected from them to help the neighborhood. Now I know probably no nobody else was doing that of going there. And I would take you know, the dinner then when she would bring the plates up there. Uh, and I would take in the dinners in there to them. And they they paid for that. They they gave back to the neighborhood. But my mother did uh sold and she if somebody was in need, she seemed to have known who needed what, when, and how much, and what the other women need to be doing to help that family. Or there was a family she would go, and they got a lot, we got a lot of commodities, and my mother made bread like you wouldn't believe. Out of all that flour, meal, you know, they gave too much and you had to take it all or, or none, because they wanted to get rid of it. And my mother made bread and she knew how to take that milk and she gave classes and showed different women how to take that powdered milk and how to mix it with the bottled milk. And instead of having one gallon, you'd have two. And you know, and how to stretch, stretch it, how to make it last and how to do stuff. And the women knew, a lot of those women just, that I, they just seemed like they came here knowing how to do that stuff. We, my dad went fishing in uh, Stillwater Creek was across a field at that time. Now they got a, a, a over there in Weston, they got a little shopping deal. I always say, well, my God, the creek was down here. What is this mall doing here on this creek? And my dad would wave to, my mother could see him from way down there and he had a signal and my mother would start getting the skillets ready with the shortening. My dad would walk up, he'd clean the fish outside, my mother would wash them up, and we would have fish and frogs, frog eggs. Yeah, I, can, I don't eat that now, but I eat fish, but I eat the frog eggs. But my brother would hold us up, we were little, and he would hold us up and he would tell my mother not to cut the leader in the leg. And in the hot grease, they would jump. You know, the legs would move. And we just, we done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> my dad would 
pick black walnuts down there, he'd bring a big bag of them, and we'd sit outside while the fish was frying, and he would make us a picker, take war and make it, and he would crack those black walnuts open, and we would pick out that meat. And those so good. So simple. <laughs> I don't think I've seen a black walnut tree around lately, though. It was one by the Girl Scout Lodge, uh, which, you know, it's still there. I don't know if they still have bare black walnuts, but that's we used to pick them up. And I used to let my kids walk to the couch's point to go swimming, and they would stop by there. But when I grew up, we we would leave, we would do our housework, and we would leave the house, and we would climb all the uh, they weren't strawberries. What do they call them? They uh, they grow wild. The berries. We would pick blackberries. Mulberries. We would climb off the mulberries. They, they would grow up through the trees, and we would climb trees and pick mulberries, and we would eat the fruit. We ate all day long off the stuff growing wild, and because uh, you couldn't run back and forth, you, when it was playtime, you played, and if it was raining, my mother would let us play out in the rain. But once we came in the house and she dried us up, cleaned us up, that was it. You couldn't go back outside. But uh, that's what I did with my kids. I would let them play when it was raining out, because kids want to play in the rain. And I would let them play out. But once they came in, that was it. They couldn't go back out. So some of them would stay out for a long, long time, you know, because <laughs> they knew once they came in and got dried up, that was it. They could watch it from the window. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be out there in the mud. I took the things that my parents taught us and incorporated the ones I liked. And the things I thought she was too strict, extra strict on, I, I was linked with on them. But I don't I, know, because <laughs> that, that commercial would come on when, when we well, were in uh, high school. Uh, Channel 4 had, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? And my mother would laugh because she knew we we were in the bed. I would, <laughs> and, I would, and I would always ask him to the TV. I would say, I know where my, I know where mine are. They in there in the bed. But a lot of parents didn't know where the kids were, and the newscaster would say that it's ten o'clock. Do you know where your children are? And at that time, I guess it had been more and more kids would be out on the street at ten o'clock at night. You know, but at 10 o'clock at night, you need to be in the bed. Mm -hmm. You sh for sure better be in your room. You wasn't sitting up. Because mm -hmm. we didn't have a TV when I grew up. We had a radio. And we would sit around the radio and listen to the news and the stories on the radio. And the radios were taller than this table back then. Because we would sit in front of the radio just like it was a TV. And my kids so you had electricity. Like we did have electricity. We did have electricity. But we knew how to light a lamp, how to put the oil, oil lamps. But we didn't have an oil stove, stove, but we had a wood stove. We knew how to make a fire. And we had a wood stove even when we had gas because my mom and dad used it. And they would put potatoes in it sometime. And my dad would treat us, he would buy coconut and Bested and pulled the milk out. We thought we was really getting something on there. So I, you know, they could fool us on stuff. They weren't trying to fool us, but it was like we thought it was more than what it was. And it just wasn't. And now, you know, I, I never did that with my kids. I never bought a coconut and let them taste that milk from the coconut. But my dad never would put potatoes in that wood stove when they would break them out. And it seemed like they were so much better. But my mother didn't bake potatoes in the gas stove. She put them in that wood stove. Mm -hmm. but, but they were they were very smart. They were country people, but they knew how to make a living. Well, how did they do laundry when you were younger? My mother had a, we did it by hand a lot, but my mother had a ringer type washer which we had forever. I had one, and uh, it had a ringer on it, 
and you had the people that were big, big women with big breasts, they had to watch it because if they got too close, you know, they could get caught in that ringer. And you see them every now and then now. But my mother had one for a long time, and I had one for a long time. Because it washed as long as you wanted it to wash. You know, just went back and forth. And then you took it through the ringer and wring it out and hung it on the line. I hung out clothes forever. I still do. <laughs> Not too many people can say that. Yeah. Not, I still hang out. <laughs> I, I, my grandkids, I had them to hang out. And the man came to pick up his son, and he said, uh, I came to pick him up. I said, well, he's helping my grandson hang out clothes. And he said, is he helping? I said, well, all of them back there is helping. They, they don't have a choice. And he said, hanging out the clothes. And I said, yeah, we're using God's dryer. He gave us the sun, so we use it. And it smells so much better. Than and we just, you know, I said, so my grandkids have to do that. I let them use the dryer. We have a dryer, but... Why use a dryer when you can hang it out? Mm -hmm. And it saves on your electric bill. <laughs> That's very true. But not a lot of people hang out. And my, my, I heard one of my granddaughters said, you mean you hang your bra and panties on the line? I went, well, yes. <laughs> she was like, oh my God, that's so personal. Why would you hang out your personal stuff on the line where everybody says she was just floored? <laughs> you know, she was, I was like, well, Who's gonna think anything about that? <laughs> she said, oh my God, anybody that passed by, or you know, walking or driving by and can see the clothesline, and here you got a bra hanging out there. And I'm like, and? <laughs> 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 she just couldn't get over that. I said, it was like, never. I would never do that. I said, well, never is a long time. It could come back to that. And lo and behold, I've seen it all over town. Mm -hmm. People hanging out stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, and we used the fence line even, because on wash day, you couldn't wait till something dry, you know, before you wash another load. You just washed and washed till everything there dirty got washed. And so we would use the fence line and clothes would be hanging all down the fence line around our house. And my kids told me, Mama, don't do that. Don't put stuff on the pencil. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Mama, you know, that's just what everybody did. Well, you had to carry your water for that, too. We kept, we packed water for a long time, but as down through the years, the water line did come down 12th Street. It took a long time. But it took lights a little longer to get lights in the neighborhood on all the street corners. They didn't have it everywhere. Well, when you say pack, what do you I mean? You carry in a in buckets and tubs. Okay. And you want to carry it by the tub. You don't want to walk that far to get a bucket of water and come home. It would take two of you to do it with the tub. It though, would take you? two of us, but we did it. Mm -hmm. We did it. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that you're doing something different because yeah, different. other families are doing the same thing. So you think you you know it's okay because everybody's doing that, but everybody knew how to survive. And as our brothers, our brothers were gone to service. A lot of them, our brothers was gone when we grew up as teenagers. Our brothers were old enough almost to be dads to us, but I, when they were there, when we were little, our brothers. Uh, would help comb our hair and braid our hair and iron our clothes and talk to us and tell us what you could and couldn't do and what not to do and stuff. So they, it was, you know, we had a close-knit family. Our brothers were like old midwives, just about like mama, you know. And they served they, in World War they II. Could, my dad did, but they could, they could cook. My, my brothers could all cook. That's why I taught my boys to cook, because I told them they weren't going to be a husband or saying, uh, honey, what are we going to eat? You go in the kitchen <laughs> and find something yourself to cook. And you we, know. Need, we need more of you around. <laughs> well, boys need to know how to sew and cook yeah. and iron. And I saw uh, uh, a guy that was, he's well-to-do now, but he said he still 
remembered this black kid that he knew, this boy, taught him how to arm and how handy that came in, that he taught him that, because he didn't grow up with a mother telling him. She did everything because that was women's work. Mm -hmm. Ain't no such thing as women's work. Who can't sweep? <laughs> well, and I, you know, taught my boys, you may not ever get married, so you do need to know how to sew, how to wash a load of clothes, how to... And how to, uh, how you know, to sort them, you know, because I've, you know, I've been at the laundromat sometime now, and men come in with bundles of clothes, and they know how to put the whites together and the light colors together and the jeans together and stuff. Mm -hmm. and they know how to do that. So somebody has taught them how to do that. Mm -hmm. Or they ended up with pink underwear at some point <laughs> and figured it yeah. out themselves. Yeah. Because I know my, my oldest son, somebody was fussing because I made him wash his clothes. And you're making him, he may not ever get married. So he needs to know how to do this stuff. And that shouldn't just be a, a woman's a woman job. Thing, right. No. So I, you're following suit here. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, it don't shouldn't think, be. Don't, don't think it shouldn't that. be. Because, if you know, when they go in service, uh, they have to learn how to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So you need to know that from home. Just already know it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it should be a woman's thing that. Now, it might be a woman's thing that if they have a daughter to comb her hair or braid her hair. But it shouldn't be just her job to wash the clothes and iron them up, you know, to teach her right and wrong and how to be respected. Mm -hmm. Because you got to show respect and know what, you know, know about your body and what shouldn't be done and what's, what's you know, go by the, the Bible is right. That's just all it is to it. And it is a guideline in the Bible for wicked ways and stuff, you know, what you should and shouldn't do. And, you know, a lot of kids, I've met kids that had never even been to church, no church. <laughs> They'd never been. On Sunday morning, that's what, what, you know, Sunday morning was God's day. We did not plan anything. We could go out on a Saturday night as we grew up, but we knew when we come in, we had to have our stuff ready for church Sunday, Saturday. You got your church clothes ready on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. You didn't come in talking about what kind of iron this blouse. My mother would have fell over dead if I'd been trying to iron on a <laughs> Sunday morning when you ought to be getting ready for Sunday school. Your clothes supposed to already be hanging there ready for you to get dressed. Mm -hmm. And you were responsible for your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you had other things to do. Because, you know, you pack water and heat water to bathe. That's a big job to do, to take care of a bunch of kids bathing them. And your kids got so smart, nobody was bathing in water behind any of water. You know, it was like, I've got to have my own water. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but it was, it was, almost everybody was raised the same in my neighborhood. So after you went to church, would you come back for a, a certain like, was Sunday dinner always the same or? No, nah, it wasn't always the same, but it was a big Sunday dinner. So if we had come to you know, any kids that came with us, you know, my mother would cook. My mother knew how to stretch food. She made soups and casseroles and it was great. And kids wanted to come home with us. And would they have revivals? Yeah, we have revivals. They brought in ministers from different states and towns and they had revivals. Our church was Pentecostal, you know, they, we did a lot of clapping and shouting and uh, it was just, uh, uh, that's why they call them Holy Rollers. Yeah. The, the closest thing to it was the Apostolic Church. Uh, we had tambourines, pianos, drums, guitars. Some people had uh, rub boards mm -hmm. and with thimbles on and they did, you know, they did that. A pastor's wife, she played the rub board, and you know, you just, you, you, we made music. Would the other churches invite you to come make music with them? Yes, we we, we fellowship with the Methodists and the Baptists because they were neighbors, you know. You can see some Southern Baptists, 
because uh, I asked a girl, I said, she said, she, I said, so you're Baptist? She said, I'm Southern Baptist. She emphasized that Southern Baptist. I didn't know what she meant. But Southern Baptist is next door to Pentecostal. So they're more strict, you know, they had a big to do in the paper a few months or years back about the Southern Baptist splitting from Baptist because Southern Baptist is really, really close door to Pentecostal. They were strict. Well, do you know when your church started, the Church of Christ, when it actually started? Church of Christ. Okay. I don't know. It was there when I came. They started. They wasn't in a building. I know that. And See, one of those pictures uh, over there talks about the Brush, uh, Brush Harbor. And I think in that article, it has the actual year. And I believe you've gotten information from... Lois Wiley about the beginning of the church as well. Yeah, I know. Uh, so it's a date in that article that says when it. Uh, well, I went to Knoxville, Tennessee with my grandson there, her son, and he took us up in the mountain. There was a lot of old churches up in there. And when I went, I was him, well, honey, I didn't really have to come up here to see that I was raised with this because the lights had the string, you know, the light bulb. A lot of houses had that. You turn the light on, and then there was a long string hanging down. You click that string down, and light come on. Uh, the pews, you know, they didn't have pillows on the pews. There wasn't no comfortable, per se, comfortable pews. There wasn't no pillows on them and fancy and all that. That was just out. There wasn't no carpet. That's the way I grew up in the church, you know. But as the churches got so fancy, I'll call them for lack of another word, you know, they just got fancier and fancier. And I would, I saw the Catholic church and it was beautiful. And my husband was Catholic. And I went to the Catholic church with him a few times. And I made sure all the kids went because they would have a choice when they got 12 if they wanted to be Catholic or something else. And they went with him one time, and they was, the church was just too quiet because they had been in the Pentecostal church for so long, and the Catholic churches at that time didn't have any kind of music. It was just real quiet. And I went one time with my husband, and I leaned over, and I said I could hear tinkling in the back, and I looked back, and they had a lot of little vases back there. And I said to him, do you have any change? And he said, Change? What do you need change for? And I said, well, I'm going back there and drop some change and get us one of them little vases. He said the priest probably would have dropped it. He would have been the only one to see me do that. And I would have stuck one of them little vases down in my purse. He said the priest probably would have <laughs> dropped it up there. If he just saw me go back there and drop some money, put one of them little vases in my purse. <laughs> but they were praying for the dead. I mean, I learned what they be doing and what the system is. And that's what they do. They they drop some money in one of them little vases and pray for the deceased. But I was raised so different to my beliefs are different. <laughs> well, how would they do funerals in, in, in yours? In your they church? had church. A lot of the funerals, they had church. Have a church service. You know, at our church, people... They have a testimony. People get up and testify on the goodness of God and what all he's did that some of them up too long, but, you know, they might go from what he did Monday to Friday. You know, that's quite a little, long testimony. <laughs> and you said never want them to hurry up and get through. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and everybody's got the same testimony, basically, because he's good to us. Mm -hmm. A funeral is pretty much just a, a church service. Uh, well, it is a church service, it is a but, church it service is, yeah. but it is the works that that person have done. Mm -hmm. Well, there's music involved, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. To it's, the, all, it's always going to be music. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, usually mean, I don't a, know if that's Usually a just, choir is singing, or usually someone is singing a solo at that funeral service. Okay. Have you ever been to a black funeral? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been there? Well, really, some of them are little, the some of them might not. They're not all the very same, but basically, they are. They are. 
And And usually um, there'll be a, at those funerals you have, uh, they'll read resolutions uh, from the different churches and stuff. Uh, Say a family member lives in another state, belongs to a, uh, a church there, that church would write up a resolution and send it in honor of that deceased person and recognizing that family member. Well, I was at a church service not long ago. I don't know if you all know Netta Jean Big. She rides in a wheelchair around town, and her son died a while back. And they had his service over at that Presbyterian church. I'd never been in that church before, right off of six. And it was so nice. And the service, it was a little different, but it was nice. You know? But usually at a church service, you know, at our church, if somebody gets the spirit, you know, they'll get up and shout. And that's what Pentecostals do. They will shout. My husband uh, came to church with me and the woman next to him uh, jumped up. You know, she, she got up and my husband, uh, he, he jumped up. And we was all like, oh my God, did he get the spirit? <laughs> oh, and he didn't know, he, he didn't know what to, you know, he just, he thought, well, she jumped up, he jumped up, he was like, I, I don't know, she jumped up, so I just jumped up. Yeah, I, you know, they stood up, and she was shouting, and he didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. And we, we have laughed about that very much. Like, when, when they get the spirit, they get up, and some of them shout, and they might leave out of that pew. And she's good at that, and I usually <laughs> uh, try to hold her on that aisle. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, it, it's it's. A lot of people come because they want to see, because mm-hmm. a lot of people don't know about the Pentecostal uh, mm-hmm. Church of God in Christ, and the, it is a Pentecostal. And it just recently changed now, Thomas. It's a non-denominational church now. Just last week, it changed hands. And we had a minister that had been there like eight years from Spencer. Yeah, well, and I mean, exactly there. Right? Well, I know it was our eight years. What, about 13, 14? Yeah, but the last, well, his wife died, got sick and died, and he was gone for about a year. Well, they changed the name, too? They did yes. change the name. It had been Lawson's, it's, Lawson it's still Temple Lawson's land and, and Lawson's building, but they took the Lawson off because the Lawson name identified with the Pentecostals. It had been a church of God in Christ all my life. And all my life. And so it just identified that it was a holiness church. And holiness means uh, church of God in Christ. But, you know, you're supposed to be holy in any church, but they don't just say holiness. But the church of God in Christ was known as a holiness church, a holy role of church because people were shocked. And apostolic is pretty close to that, to the Pentecostals, as far as clapping and shouting, because that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And then it wasn't a sign there forever, but when I was growing up, you just knew where the churches were. They didn't have signs out. You just knew they were there. I don't even think the Methodist Church had a sign. You know, Temple Cross Ramsey, right by that bridge on Temple Street. The Methodist Church set up in that corner. That's where I got married at. My wedding was at in that church because it was a big church. And we were expecting a great big crowd. So I got married at the Methodist Church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it, well, it didn't say Methodist Church anywhere because yeah, we didn't did. take pictures out for us. Yeah. But it was there a long time. They just they just finally told that down. I don't know how long you've been in Stillwater, but it was there for a good while. And the foundation of it stayed there. Probably still there, that brick that the house that the church sent on was there. And I always thought the city should have put the splash park over there. Because there's no park in where it's at. So they take up my block. Mm-hmm. And and you know, you can't go 
two cars can't come down my block when the scratch park is open. Mm -hmm. Who noticed that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I always thought it should have been off in another area, not right on that corner. Well, I know the neighborhood has changed a lot since the time when you were a child, even to mm -hmm. to you, uh, but you chose to stay in it? Well, yeah, I bought my home in it. And you, uh, the house we're in, I bought, we bought the house in July of 1974, and the principal was, they had lived there a long time. Lee Wood was the principal. A Washington school, and when they integrated, he went to Highland Park for a little while. But when it, when I was looking to buy houses, urban renewal came through Stillwater. This is why a lot of people moved out of the neighborhood. It had flooded every time it would rain, it would flood, and that's the area that flooded. Uh, and I guess it was, I don't know if that was 59, but it must have been a little later than 59. But it flooded so bad, you, we would we stayed up at the American Legion, and we would walk down Ninth and stand up on Ninth and Jefferson and look down the water house. You could just see the roof, and the flood that's going on in North Carolina remind me of it so much, because people were in boats coming out down through here. It was it was really bad, and that happened two three times, and so people wanted to get out of that flood area. So people, as they every renewal came through, they moved, and they got went to na other neighborhoods, because it was known as the black community when I grew up. It was the black community, and I'm the only black in my block right now. But Lee Ward had a sign out, and I didn't know what the sign said, and we were looking at houses, and I had been all over town, and I didn't want to move in a house where somebody had. Uh, took their lot and they showed me two different houses and the woman that was showing me, she thought I didn't know what I was talking about and she showed me and I said, well, I can't live in this house. I, I just I just couldn't live here. I wouldn't be comfortable here. And she said, uh, well, it's not in these papers that I have. It's a law that is in the papers. She just didn't have the right papers, but she saw that. Um, and. I looked at a lot of houses, but Lee Ward had a sign out and he was having roofing or something down that call and I said, are y'all selling your house? And his wife said, no, but he's in the frame of mind now. He's ready to move. So my husband went up there and talked to him. So we got the house that Lee Ward had. Okay. And he had been the principal here in Stillwater mm -hmm. for a long time. And back on the pond out there, he's got that he built that pond in uh, 59, 1959, but uh, people moved in different neighborhoods and they, now it's not a black neighborhood, it's per true. se, mm -hmm. it, but it's known as that from previous years back, that that was the black neighborhood. Washington School was a black school and they sold the school and the alumni didn't get a chance to be it on it or buy it. And so there's been a sore spot with a lot of people for a long time. And it has never sold the guy that owned it. Now he's tried to sell and had signs out, but it has never sold because there was some wrongdoing in it, mm -hmm. in it. And they didn't know what to do with it if it sold. So they suggested if it sold, people could go get a brick if they wanted. Well, who wants a brick? I mean, you got your memories and you got your pictures and you've got everything. And to a lot of families, it's going to always be Washington School. Mm -hmm. And they never understood. Cushing integrated. They gave the school to the black community. They had it towed out and had a church built there. Ponca City, they gave the school to the black community. And they wonder. Why come still why they wouldn't have did like those other talents did? Why didn't they give it to the alumni? Let the alumni decide what to do with it. Because as a lot of us say, okay, I went to school to Washington School, but I was I graduated from Stillwater High School. I graduated from C. E. Dorna. But I was in the tenth grade when they integrated. But a lot of them 
graduated from Washington School. All my brothers graduated at Washington School. And so it's going to always be Washington School to them. And they don't have any function down there now. And the school just deteriorated and deteriorated and deteriorated. Well, and see, and I, I didn't go to Washington School, but when I was coming up, uh, men in the neighborhood, Mr. Kenneth Murray, uh, Mr. Edward Bolden, uh, Kenneth Johnson, they would open up the school down there where you could go and you could play in the gym and stuff. And they always had stuff for the youth to be able to go in there and do and turn the lights on at the park where you could go down at the park and play and uh, Edna, uh, Finley, she was Kennard at that time, I think. Uh, she would turn on the lights. So those were places that we could go in the neighborhood as kids and play. And the rec center was there for a little bit when I was a, a smaller kid. So I do remember that rec center there in the park at one time, during my time. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they had meetings, because I remember going to those meetings, and it was said that if if they let them move the, uh, tear down the wreck, it was two buildings, one was like a schoolhouse, and then the other one was just a big wreck, like it could have been anything put in there, dinners or whatever, that they would have a place in the neighborhood for the, ne for the neighbors down there to go to, for activities for the kids and all that. And so that sounded good at those meetings, and a lot of people voted for that. And now nobody can find the records that that was said. And we had a, a, a mayor here, and he said if they ever could find the records, he would see to it that they would put another building in the neighborhood for the youth. Because our youth just kind of went wild. They just had nowhere to really go, and they were just all over town, and they got into a lot of devil men and doing stuff because there was nothing in the neighborhood. Because at that time, it was more families in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But as the families all moved out of the neighborhood and left the town and the state, and uh, they just come back for the Washington School reunion. But they come back in memory of good times, mm -hmm. happy times. And they don't want to stop having it. So the ones that's over now and having it, they just went to elementary, because they kept the elementary school for years at Washington School when the integration came. They, you know, they had the elementary was still down there until <coughs> through the fifth grade or fourth or fifth or sixth grade. They still went to Washington School in elementary. And they brought kids from other places down to Washington School for the elementary. It was, it was a good while before they went totally to other schools. Mm -hmm. But Lincoln had been over there forever, but where the Board of Education is at, that was a school when I was in school. Okay. Uh, that was called Jefferson. And uh, they had a school over there where IGA was at. It was a schoolhouse over there for a long time. Do you remember the schoolhouse over there? Christmas Baby. Uh-huh. Eugene Fields, that's where that one, that's the only one I, re I've heard people so, talk about. You know, but that was close to our neighborhood, but it wasn't right in our neighborhood. Because we considered our neighborhood to have stopped at 9th Street, because okay. very few blacks. Uh, at one time, they were all up and down Washington going to Ward 6th Street, but then they all kind of congregated back down toward 9th, and that's where the majority of the blacks that lived in Stillwater was at. A lot of them moved and went on places. Well, did they refer to the, the neighborhood that by a certain term, or did you just call it the black community? Or well, did they have a when I was coming up, the neighborhood was referred to as the Ville. The Ville, okay. When I when I was coming up, it was referred to as the as the Ville, and a lot of the college uh, kids that were up at OSU that would come down to the neighborhood. That is how they referred to it as going down to the bill. Because a lot of the blacks that was at OSU did come and mix in the neighborhood. They came to the churches down there and they met people and they came to a lot of functions that went on down there. Yeah. And then all of them come back even. 
Blacks or whites or both? Well, it was both, but mostly blacks. But it was some whites. Because whites were all around on the edge, and a lot of whites mixed. Uh, there was a lot of good white people, and a lot of them mixed. And my parents knew a lot of them, and a lot of them knew the people in the neighborhood. Because a lot of our teachers, when they integrated, our teachers didn't get jobs. And so a lot of them left Stillwater and went to other cities and towns so they could get jobs. A lot of them went to Oklahoma City, worked to Tinker, a lot of them went to Tulsa, and a lot of them went on down to Dallas. A lot of the black teachers didn't have jobs once integration came. They did not get, Miss Johnson eventually had a job here, Ruth Johnson, but uh, they brought in, some black teachers did come from other places through the years, but they wasn't Stillwater people. I was wondering what happened to the teachers once. Yeah. And so Mrs. Johnson's the only one. Who... She, they, her people, her dad had a grocery store when she was coming up. It's called Haskins Grocery Store, right on the corner of Hester and um, 12th, across from the school. Because the teacher used to send me over there to get her a cookie every day. And she would send me, to, her husband taught on one side. She taught on the elementary and her husband taught on the high school. And she'd send me over to the high school to tell her husband, give me two pennies, so she, I could go across the street over there and get her a cookie. And it was a big thing because he would fuss about it. <laughs> he would fuss. And I was from one that, my God, talking about two pennies, I wouldn't want to be, be, be my husband, you know, and get it. You know, two pennies was two pennies. <laughs> but it, it was funny as should've, I got older. Should have been three so you could get yourself one. No, we just did, we went over there and got, but it was getting out of the classroom and getting on to the high school side. And, uh, Teacher's pet. And they had, uh, the school was a new school, Washington School, you know, they built. And then they built Westwood and modeled it after Washington School. But there was outside, outside hallways. One, one side of it was open, and they called it outside hallways. And it turned out not to be so great, because when the weather got bad in the winter, you know, all the weather, you were in the elements and stuff. Mm -hmm. But we had a band, and they brought in a band teacher. And I can remember when we got suits, and when we got the instruments, it was so wild and crazy. It was such a fun time, because nobody knew how to play anything. And we were just picking out, okay, I want to play the trumpet. I want to be saxophone playing. I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was just kind of wild. It was funny. Did you pick one? Yeah, I, I played the uh, French horn which was an odd thing to pick because, you know, by that time, everybody already had the saxophone. You know, it would have been great to have been a saxophone player, you know, you know trumpet we, player. We laugh as, yeah. as her children because uh, her band, uh, Stillwater Through the Years, has a picture of her in the band. And we were like, well, where are the other band members at? Well, she was just a small band. <laughs> <laughs> well, we practiced walking up and down 12th Street in, you know, walking uh, in unison. And as we started wearing just jeans and my t-shirt, it made it look, you know, like you really was doing something. But the band teacher picked out something that he knew we all had. But all those old women that sit down 12th Street out in the yard, well, when the band would go down there, walking up down 12th Street to practice, of course, we would get all kind of claps and how good we looked and was doing, and we thought it was just great, you know. Because <laughs> all those old people thought we was doing just great. And it's funny now to look back on that, to see that. But but they were our audience for a long time. And we didn't have band suits for a while. But they finally, we were able to get band suits at Washington School. So we were in the band. And it was, it was a fun time. Because everybody wasn't in the band, but the ones that were, and uh, it, it was it was it was neat. It was neat. It was it was a close knit family life. Mm -hmm. it, just many people, but a close knit family. Mm -hmm. And integration changed all of that. It did. It, was, it, it was, did. And a lot of people were didn't wasn't in favor of that. 
Uh, they were in favor of parts of it, but not all of it. Uh, some people were unhappy. I never was unhappy at the school, but a lot of kids didn't adjust to that. To they didn't, and they a lot of people could feel the prejudice because a lot of families talk that, and that's included in a lot of those kids. But uh, it was enough of them that the kids I were with, uh, what they did was they they pick out the kids that they wanted, and those kids were your God, and if you had any questions or anything, you could just ask them, I'm kind of lost, because we went from a one-story school up here, and it was upstairs and downstairs, and cross, you know, homemade was in a separate building around over in there, and, but you could ask those kids anything, and they were with you, and they would tell you, and they picked the best kids to do that, and the woman that owned the Hideaway Pizza Martha, she was one of those guides, and her husband, he wasn't a husband then, but you know, but they were, they were, some of those kids were great. So I, I had fond memories of my teachers and the kids, but a lot of the kids didn't have that. And it ended up, it only was three blacks that ended up still at the school by the time we got to be seniors. It was just me and Edna, uh, her son is the coach out at Stillwater High School, and they call him Chick, but his name is. Uh, what was his Michael. name? Michael Davis. Mm -hmm. and, and Dorothy Lee, she's a Chanel, but she was a brown then, and it was just the three of us. And I went to some of the school reunions because they would all, you know, you get those little notes and I'm going, really, y'all, please come. Come up to the hideaway to the, you know, the meet and greet and all that. And we found out I went to a few of them. And I told her, I said, I can't remember everybody's names. But you, what you have to look at, I was just with y'all three years, and y'all had been together from elementary. Y'all went to elementary all through your years, you were together. But I just remember three years of it. And then I got married in that senior year, so, <laughs> uh, you know, I went to school less and less. In fact, I couldn't miss another day else I wouldn't have graduated because I had one class in the afternoon, and it was typing, and I thought, well, you know, what do I need typing for? I, I didn't, couldn't see myself with a typing job, but I did end up getting one. But, you know, it was kind of like, mm -hmm. she, they call you in and say, you can't miss, you have to be in school so many days to graduate, mm -hmm. even now. So, that I did graduate, <laughs> but I couldn't miss another day because mm -hmm. I didn't want to go back in the afternoon. And one of her teachers, actually became one of my teachers because uh, Miss Loper was her teacher and years later became my teacher. And Miss Loper's husband was one of the coaches. He was basketball, football coach. And did she remember your mother? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there wasn't that many of us to remember. And then one of my teachers, my son, ended up with her. I couldn't believe that Miss Hoffman was still. Miss Hoffman still out there. Still out there. <laughs> Curtis Davis is still. Out. Some of those teachers been at the high school thirty and thirty five years, mm -hmm. still there. You know, so a lot of kids went through them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was it was. Mm -hmm. I, I have fond memories, and I read some stuff what they write about how what they didn't like, and I don't know how. I view it so different from what they viewed it. Because mm. we came from the same neighborhood. Well, I think a lot of people just, change is difficult for a lot of people and it's how you set your mind to receive that change. Well, if you have one bad experience, change. I don't judge a whole race of people by what one or two people say or do. Mm. So I just don't. I worked here at this library, and this is the one job I had I didn't like. And all because I couldn't, they put books on hold. They got in a new title, they would put it on hold. People would call in, have on the list, because they would only have one or two of that copy. And I was told how to do it five or six different ways on the computer, and I never got it 
in my head. I would get all tangled up, putting it in there, and remember what Sally Sue said, and what Jean said, and Judy said, and <laughs> so I would go like, oh, the heck with that. They'll get one when they get one. <laughs> <laughs> but I did like it, and I thought, okay, this is not for me. Well, then let's back up, take us through your jobs. Where your first one was after you got married, you, what did you do? I did housework in different homes. Okay. And uh, then I went to work at Oklahoma Natural Gas Company. It was on Main Street, and I was the home service maid. And we taught the Girl Scouts uh, how to cook. They had classes. One week they learned how to do bread, one week they learned how to do vegetables, and, one, and then the last week they would put it all together. They learned how to do meats. And a little girl came in, they had to learn how to cut up a chicken, and a little girl fainted. She absolutely passed out <laughs> and scared us all to death, you know. And uh, <laughs> she just had never did that at home. Well, we grew up learning that stuff in my day. Who didn't know how to cut up a chicken? You might not have got it exactly right, but you, you cut that chicken up. And that little girl passed out. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny that they up there. And um, then the last week they did a whole meal, put it together, and then their parents would get to come and see what they had done. And they did that for a long time. And that I enjoyed that working with those little girls coming and learning how to put vegetables and make bread and all that. And uh, I, I had the offer to go work, learn how to be the cashier, and I refused because I just didn't think I could meet the public and speak right and make, you know, take gas bill money, pay the gas bill. You know, you used to go in and pay your gas bill stuff. And so, I was comfortable with upstairs doing the food and working with. And then they had a lot of, not a lot, but they had a few uh, women's clubs here in Stillwater. I don't know what they call some of them. But then they would have a meal at the gas company and they would uh, have a bit to do. And it was for those women, they enjoyed that and they had that. And then the black women started having different clubs <laughs> and meals and uh, they just got with the program. And I left there, they decided that they were going to have, my kids were in Head Store, and a lot of the women that came down to Head Store, husbands had offices up at OSU, and they decided that we were smart enough to be in offices and do office work, and they, were, they began to encourage us to apply and get jobs up at OSU. And they said, I would be in one of them husband's office and I didn't know which one and I was real nervous about it but I did get a job up at OSU in my office as a typist and I went to in the reading boutique and honed on my skills of typing and worked and then I got jobs up at OSU and I worked at the reading center for I don't know how many years and I got a job in the student union at the bookstore and I stayed there 25 years and retired and then part of working at OSU, they paid your insurance. My husband worked at the hotel at one end of the building and I worked at the bookstore at the other one. And they paid our insurance. He retired after 20 some years. And when I retired, lo and behold, we had to pay our own insurance, which we wasn't used to paying insurance out of our budget. But we had it, not that we were going to the doctor that much either. And uh, he said, well, we're going to do just drop it. And I said, well, we're, we're going to keep it. We just paid ourselves for a while. And it got really expensive. But we kept it. And I'm glad we did. So how old were you when you retired? I was like 52. So you were young? Okay. I was young. I was too young. And people told me that. A lot of the old people would say, well, you're too young to retire. What are you going to do? But when I was growing up and had my kids, I didn't, I worked housework, but I was hooked on the story. So I did work for people as uh, as the world turned. 
<laughs> it had to be around as the world turned, <laughs> or the guy didn't lie to <laughs> And it was just, you know, in that stuff, general hospital, all that stuff, it was, every, you know, you just, well, I was just hooked on that stuff, you know, and I had my work had to come. And as the world turned, change, you know, they would change, they would be on just 30 minutes at the end and do something, well, keep you hanging on for the next time. And, Lord, it took me a while to get out of that. <laughs> and my kids all got hooked on stuff, and they would have one of them trying to tape it for them. What was that called? Young and the Wrestlers or something. And they would come in from school. Did you watch it? Did you get this? And we were like, oh my God, it would be so fun. And I'm like, well, what can I say to them? Because I was in that same boat. <laughs> But I don't know if women even still watch that stuff anymore. You know, so. It's probably more Oprah or... Yeah, Ellen it's more talk shows and stuff. Ellen, <laughs> Ellen or whatever her name is. Uh, I watch Family Feud the most out of everything in Cash Cow. Times have changed, haven't they? They have really changed. They really changed. But the, even the TVs now have changed. And back then you just had an antenna to get into stuff. And we thought it was just great when the cable people came. We didn't know it was going to be a bill with us for the rest of our life. <laughs> and every two years, they vote in a raise, <laughs> and your bill go up. And me and my sister fussed about that. Now, do we really need that? <laughs> Is that something we can do without? Yeah, now add the computer to it, and it's even more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, 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 uh, I worked down here for about a year. They said I would have the job when I asked about it, and they said as long as I pass the drug test, and I said, well, when do I store it? Because I know I was going to pass, you know. And it was right over there where the uh, arts and sciences said it was a building over there. I went over there. That's where they did my interview and stuff at. Was over there. I don't know what that building was. I don't think it was, what do they call it now, arts? Prairie arts. Prairie well, it was. Oh, it was graphic arts for Bible. It, 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 it was something else. It was a different name because that's where I went. And I said, well, when can I store it? And she said, as soon as we do the background check, you pass. And I said, well, when would that be? Because I could store it today and I know I'm going to pass. Because I knew I was going to pass. <laughs> it was different. So when you were growing up, did you use the public library up on Sick? I did. Uh -huh. I used to go up there quite a bit. A Richard was up there. Was a man up there named Richard then. He moved down here when they came here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. He had been there a long time. He knew everything in Stillwater. You could go in there and say, I don't know, I'm looking for such and such. And Richard yeah, would he find could it. pull that microfish stuff up. He could find you what you were asking him about. Mm -hmm. Yes, he knew. And mm -hmm. I guess he had lived here a long time because he knew almost everything. But mm -hmm. I went up there quite a bit. That's when I got my first. I would uh, get library books. But Washington School kept a library for a long time, and I would go down there and get stuff at the library at Washington School. Because they kept the library even when it was elementary for some reason. They didn't. And adults could go check out books mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So when you were in grade school, you would sometimes go to the 6th Street Library? Uh-huh, uh-huh. When I was in, I don't know when I started, but it was before I was I went to the high school even. We had just had um, one person say that they weren't, a, they basically weren't allowed to go in. Into the library? Mm -hmm. See, in I the, remember going to the library It's been up there. I, I took my kids up there. Of course, I worked over at, on Main at the gas company. I think this would have been. And it was Safeway's grocery stores right there where they got that beer deal now. That used to be a grocery store for years. I think he, he's talking about a time uh, before integration had to be so that's um, so that might have been later that that you went or do you think you went when you were real young as well I don't know but I was never told that because I went up there quite a bit and I was married even in 59 I got married and it was during that time in the 59 60s well, uh, about three religions yeah yeah I went up there quite a bit, and it would always be so quiet. Mm -hmm. But I always had in mind what I was going to get anyway. So 
because I did a lot of writing and book reports and uh, pick out different things. I did a big book report on, uh, his last name was Carl, but he, he planted the peanut. George uh, Washington Carl. Uh, how many things was made from that peanut. And people just, uh, you know, had to been born experimenting and knowing what to do. But they, uh, from the peanut, even black shoe polish was invented. And I remember reading a lot of the stuff that came from the peanut. And Mr. Wood had a peanut patch in the yard when I bought that house. He had a, uh, he had a strawberry patch, a peanut patch, and he'd raise pigeons. And he, uh, what did he raise over there? It was all that butterflies used to be over there. It was to feed something. He planted that and it come up wild now. And he planted wild garlic along the fence line, wild onions. And you get that smell when they start coming up. It's like, well, Mr. Ward is still here. <laughs> Him and his wife, he, he took pictures at my wedding, and he felt like he didn't do a good job, so he didn't give them to me for a long time. But his wife called me one day and said she had my wedding pictures. She, she said even though there were some mistakes made, she knew I would love to have them, and I did. And he got them. Yeah, but Mr. Ward was a member of that Methodist church. Uh, just a few, they had fewer members than the Holiness Church and the Baptist Church, but it was some people that went to the Methodist Church. And when the Methodist Church ended, a lot of those people joined Church of Christ. Those few black families that had been going to the Methodist Church, they joined the Church of Christ. But it seemed like everybody else in the neighborhood stayed in the neighborhood. And our little church was just a little small, small church which it was fixed up during the years, but it was still small compared to other churches. It was still small. And when the Latter-day Saints was getting rid of their building over there on McElroy because it had mold in it, uh, I, she saw it on TV and I called them in and I went and met him and they gave our church pews and chairs and uh, refrigerator and cook stuff, just just any, every, anything and everything. We went over, they built a new church out of Weston and uh, what, 32nd beautiful church. But we got a lot of that, a lot of that stuff. Well, how would your church do like Christmas? Did they do anything special for Christmas? Oh yeah, we always had a Christmas, Christmas program. program. Kids yeah. learned speeches. Mm -hmm. We gave our Christmas bags and had enough for any matter that just dropped in, you know. What would be in the bag? Orange and orange apples and, and candy and, and nuts and, and, and uh, colored uh, Christmas candy. Uh, uh, what was that candy called? It was it would a, be in a big can. Ribbon candy? It was, uh, a, it was something a, like the ribbon candy, but it was the uh, pieces, the squares of candy that was in the different colors. Yeah. It was a store called Douglas that was across from Fairline Cemetery, across the street. And my mother was would be over those Christmas bags. And she would always go out there to buy the apple and oranges because she got a good discount. And uh, <laughs> well, I guess she would have went there anyway, but it was one of the stores that was there. But, and I don't know what, I don't know, I guess it was called Douglas. But it was a store across from Fairlawn Cemetery, and I used to go with her. My mother didn't drive. She decided she would buy a car one time. She saved up. It was a car lot on 9th Street over there by where the Salvation Army is at now. And she took me up there with her, and she bought a car. And when the salesman, he said, well, Miss Lynn said, who's going to drive this car? And she said, she is. And he said, can you drive a stick? And I said, I didn't know what he was talking about even. And I had drove a automatic for a little bit, just heard it, you know, I knew how to put it in D and all of <laughs> So he drew a steering wheel on a piece of paper and he told me 
to pull it in and push it up and pull it down. But you had to work the clutch and the brake. So your feet was busy and your hand was busy, but I drove it home with mama. <laughs> <laughs> drove it off the lot. And you know, we lived on 12 and this was over here. There was a little ways driving it, but I got it down to the house. <laughs> And Mama just believed I could do it, you know, because she couldn't drive. She was one of the few women in the neighborhood that couldn't drive a car. Well, did she learn after that? No. <coughs> no, she never got the hang of it. And those Christmas bags that she would do, they would have uh, nuts on them as well. They'd have walnuts and uh, pecans in there. And uh, so we kind of kept that going <coughs> even because and the keys all could all I, I, in later years, I would put together Christmas, Christmas. bags. And Same the kids thing. all had to learn a speech. They had to learn Christmas speech. And it couldn't be just one or two lines. It had to be a speech. And they learned how to stand up in front of the people. And, you know, most kids had something new for Christmas on. You know, that's when you got a new some outfit. Stuff. But it, it was quite a few kids in our, in our neighborhood. And then in the summertime, they had Bible school, and my mother was real active in Bible school, and they were bringing missionaries from other mm -hmm. cities. And uh, Vacation Bible School. They had Vacation Bible School. It was a place for you to go, and then they would feed you dinner. You stay in there and learn Christian stuff, church stuff, and they feed you dinner, and then you go get to go home. But they had that every summer, and a lot of the kids came to that from all the denominations that came to Bible school. And what was a big treat to a vacation Bible school was if you uh, learned particular things, then you would be awarded a Bible. And that was a, a big thing for us, is getting this Bible during vacation Bible school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because most kids had to, the churches had programs to, at the Holiness Church, they had something that was called YPWW, and it was called Young People's Willing Worker. And kids would go to that. And they had to say what that Y meant. So, young people, you are yourself in the garden. You. And we, we remember that to this day, what that YPWW mm -hmm. says. It's always a verse with it, what that, what that came from. Mm -hmm. My, my cousin was Baptist, but she would come to that and she would always say, I know the YPWW. Mm -hmm. A lot of them knew the YPWW. Because our church would have YPWW <clears throat> and the Baptist church would be having BTU. And so they would be learning stuff and exactly. we would be learning stuff. It was stuff. called Baptist Training Union. That's what the BTU was. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of the churches mixed. Because one sister might belong to the church, this church, and the other sister belong to the other. So in a function that either church was having a special mm -hmm. program, it was always, and they church always got out on time. I mean, you know, they church was out. Uh, if church started at 11 by 12, you know, 12, 30, they were out. Our church, as the spirit led, <laughs> We'd have to be there wishing, oh, I guess she'd get through shouting, you know, <laughs> we ready to go home and eat, because my mother would be the night ready to cook, but we go to church. She would have almost all the dinner ready, and we'd be ready to go home and eat, and somebody would still be clapping and shouting at our church. And uh, they said the church would be out, and a lot of them would come on in to our church and stay till our church was out on their way home because they all had relatives at the different churches. Mm -hmm. And my kids couldn't, my kids delivered the newspaper in the neighborhood. And I looked in their book to see, me and my husband started taking the paper from as they got in sports in school, because we used to live on 12th and West Street right up here. So we would get the paper and we would start taking it in our block, the next block, all the blocks close. And I looked in their book to see what names did they put as people? And they would put the color of the house. <laughs> the green house behind the blue house, the purple house that's over by the black house. So it was like, they didn't know nobody's names. I don't know how they collected the money, the paper, the paper. It was just, 
I had to go give them a lesson in names and writing in the book whose name was and addresses, not the color of the house. Yeah, it was so funny. I told my husband, well, who would thought that's the way they would do that? Hmm? But they delivered the paper. And the, some of the people, one woman lived down there, the dog pound used to be right down on the, what was that, West Street? And you would turn, it's a little, and the dog pound was down there. And uh, she lived almost close to that dog pound. Her name was, last name was Hill, Mr. Miss Hill. And she would give them a grocery list as they delivered the paper where they stopped by the store. <laughs> and they would. And then I got that when they, my son had football practice, so I would go. And so she gave the list to me and she wanted me to get her some snow. She said it was five stars, four stars, something. So, um, and the, the weather was bad and I rushed up to IGA and I, I just got a can of snuff and got it down there and she called me and said, I had the wrong kind. She she dipped four star and I got five star or something like that. And I said, well, you'll have to dip that today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going back out, the weather's bad, you know. And you just did that without even thinking, well, I'm, t I'm delivering the newspapers and here I am buying groceries for these people. Would they get their grocery list? Of course, they were older people, you know, and I thought, okay, just, you just do that. That's just, that just comes with it. And that's what I would tell them sometimes when they'd be fussing about something. I said, that, that just comes with the territory. <laughs> that's part of what comes with it, doing that, yeah. And it, it was fun. We were friends with, it was the neighborhood, the white neighborhood that was close to our neighborhood. We, we became friends with those kids that lived there. Because kids are going to play with kids. Mm -hmm. The people stay out of it. Kids aren't looking at you're black and I'm white, or you're yellow and I'm brown. Or, they're not looking at that. They just make friends. And that's, 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 what, that's the way it should be. But as people want to know, if people say, uh, what nationality are you? Some kids don't even know. And anymore, it's a true saying because it's so mixed. Some kids just don't even know what. Now you can pay for that DNA. I don't know what it costs, but a lot of people are doing that. Well, who wants to know that you got 6% this and 40% that? And You'd be surprised. It ain't nothing <laughs> that's saying 100%. You'd be surprised. You know. But I worked with a lot of people, of, a lot of different nationality people, and I bet it was you, it was a lot of international people. And I learned how to deal with them because their customs are different. When I come up in the bookstore, you saw lots of different, different. I saw a lot. And a lot of them weren't used to women. Uh, and women, come time for cap and gowns, I was over cap and gowns. And a lot of them weren't used to women giving orders and saying stuff. And they wouldn't take orders from me. And the head man had to go in and talk to them and see, you know, what was going on. You know, because in their countries, they weren't used to that. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't used to nobody saying no to me. Was it because you're a woman or because, oh, you were because a woman? I was a woman? Because the women don't have freedom in a lot of those countries. Mm -hmm. they, they don't, you know, I don't, this is what they say. I've never been in those countries. But from what all I've heard, they don't have the freedom to say and do. The husband's in charge of that. And it's whatever the husband. And I did watch Not Without My Daughter. <laughs> just, did you see that? You know, and that was based on a true story. And that, that was an eye opener. So, but OSU used to have quite a few international. Now they have even more because they come from all different countries. And a lot of Africans. I, I was proposed to, I don't know how many times, and I'm, well, I'm already married. <laughs> You know, uh, well, you know, don't you already have a wife? Well, you could be wife number three. Well, what do wife number three do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was curious. I was like, you got three wives. 
what do wife number one and wife number two, what did wife number three do? What's not for her to do? <laughs> oh my God, it was, you know, it was, it was an eye opener. I learned a lot up there. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was there so long, kids were coming back saying, uh, Grandma said, see if you were still here. I said, okay. If the grandkids are in school now, it's time for me to be retired. <laughs> <laughs> and so I retired. But things got so high, I went back to work. And I've been at the high school now 13 years as a custodian because I decided I wanted a job that I didn't have to answer the phone, didn't have to put stuff in the computer, I didn't have to dress up. I was tired of wearing high heel shoes, pantyhose, and stuff every day. And so I just wanted a job I could just throw on something go to work even if we're just pushing a broom and have a salary and that's what I did and I've been there 13 years <laughs> I bet some of the kids get used to having you around well, a lot of them they've graduated and they've got kids out there now <laughs> and my grandkids was there but they always wanted to help grandma and I would say no you can't help grandma because you're not on the insurance so if you was to get hurt or something so you couldn't I couldn't let them do anything at least they offered though. Oh yeah, they would offer. <laughs> they would offer. Mm-hmm. And they would tell our kids, that's my grandma, you know. But yeah, they would offer to help. But it, it was against the rules. And it did make sense, you know, if they got hurt, if they wouldn't be on the, on the insurance. Mm-hmm. So, but I'm kind of looking forward now to kind of planning on. A second retirement. Oh, huh? second mm-hmm. retirement. But, but things get so high and you get so in debt and these little houses just need remodeling and fixing up sometimes. And I got to thinking, I went like, well, you know, I've been here 44 years in this one house. It's a long time. And, and Mr. Wood was probably there longer than that when he was there. Mm-hmm. And, but I remember my days down on 12th Street. I was raised up, came, came about. And when we first moved, because we were in a two-bedroom house with six kids, and I had bunk beds in the dining room for the boys. And uh, me and my husband had a hide bed We let out a hide bed every night. I hate hide beds you know. <laughs> uh, every night we couldn't let the hide bed every morning, no matter what. If you had company, you couldn't let the hide bed out to the cupboard left. Or, you know, you had to put it up every morning so that you could use the living room. God, I never want to know how to be. But I did have one. My daughter would come over with her girls, and we would have girls' night out on a Friday night. And we, I let the how to be out, and we'd have popcorn and watch movies. But mm-hmm. how to be is was that was a pain when <laughs> you had to have it. Yeah, you we needed it. But we slept in the same room. Me and my four sisters. It was five of us. And my my dad had we had uh, what eight I think eight brothers. He didn't and then he named me Willie, and he didn't name any of those boys Willie. <laughs> and I used to ask them because I got teased a lot in school, and the boys would tease me, my classmates would tease me, and they call me Bill and Will, and I got teased. And my name was Willie. Why did he choose Willie? Do you know? Did I don't know say? why he had named none of those boys Willie. But my auntie was there and she said, well, if you're going to put Willie, you have to put Ann with it because her name was Annie. And she, so they put Willie Ann. And most Willie, black women, are Willie maids. Mm-hmm. Almost all of them that I've ever heard, they were Willie maids. But I'm Willie Ann. And a lot of people have had a hard time distinguishing that I'm not Willie May, I'm Willie Ann. Because they would try to call me Willie May and I wouldn't answer to that. Mm-hmm. And I'm not Willie May. I am Willie Ann. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my dad was Willie, but he, he put that name. He gave me that name. I'm next to the baby girl. Well, he named him after himself then, if it Yeah, if he named Willie. me after him. Named me Willie. And were you I have a brother named Abraham Lincoln. I have a brother named Chesterfield. That's the name of a cigarette. Uh, Luther Tucker, that was kind of my odd name. Luther's an old name. And a lot of people name kids after stuff in the Bible. But blacks 
a lot of the older blacks name their kid after somebody in the family. And the kid nowadays, anything that sound different or whatever, they name them after wine and uh, whiskey and what you name it, you know. They just name their kids after anything. What were the other, your other siblings' names? My sister, my, I have a sister named Mitty. That was our grandmother's name was Mitty. M-I-T-T-I-E. Mm -hmm. And I have a sister named Christine. And I uh, uh, have a sister named Elmer or Josephine. And they usually picked a Bible name to go with, whatever. Or a president, if it was a But Abraham name. Lincoln, it was a Abraham Lincoln in Ponca City, one in Cushing, one in Guthrie, <laughs> one a Pawnee was a Abraham Lincoln. A lot of black women named a son Abraham Lincoln. But my son, my brother was Abraham Lincoln Lindsay, but it was an Abraham Lincoln African, Abraham Lincoln. Just every town had an Abraham Lincoln. And I don't know why they named a, a kid after, Abraham, after the president. I didn't think he, you know, what did he do so great that, you know, you're naming your kid after him. The Emancipation I, Proclamation. I know women, they, name, they name their kids after the months. I know somebody named their kids. Uh, March, April, May, June, July, August. I even know a girl was named August. But who names a kid after the months? <laughs> I, I work with a girl and uh, my supervisor. His daughter named her daughter Summer, and her last name was Day. So her name ended up being Summer Day. It, it, it was just odd names. Of course, what's the one name that worked for Clinton in? Um, the black woman, I always said her name. She had all those names. She spoke all them different languages. Oh, Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice. She had a lot of different names. Condoleezza was just one. But Condoleezza is an odd name. Well, then where did Birdie come? My mother's my, name. My grandmother's name was Birdie. And my sisters refused to name their daughter Birdie. So she told me, had nobody named their daughter Birdie. What was wrong with that name? So I named her Mary. And but see, when time. I was coming up, I went by because my name is Birdie Diane. Well, my mom calls me Diane, but my job would call me Birdie. So, in but the I but in the school, but I answered it either one. Well, the doctor. I had twins. She has a twin brother, and Doctor Rippy uh, wanted me to name him. Uh, he said. Name them Tom and Jerry. I was asking the nurses, you know, give me twin names. And so they all had a list of twin names. So the doctor wanted me to name them Tom and Jerry. Well, that's that cat and mice. You know, I'm not naming my kid that. He said, well, you can name them Thomas and Geraldine and just call them Tom and Jerry. And I tell them all the time, that's what I should have named y'all because y'all I got that. <laughs> I said, I should have named y'all Tom and Jerry. That's what the doctor wanted me to name y'all. So what is his name, the, the boy? Uh, Curtis Dwayne. Curtis Dwayne. Yeah. Yeah, Diane and Dwayne, that was close enough. But Curtis Dwayne, um, that's Daryl's name, middle name, his uncle. My brother's name is Daryl Dwayne. Uh, and so I named Curtis after him. And I named her son Daryl, one her son named Daryl. My after son, my, after my brother, uh, he didn't like Daryl, so he, and, he told me that years later. He, we he, called him Bobo for so long because kids nickname their brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. You know, if you got a brother or sister, they'll nickname you, and that's what everybody end up calling you is what they call you, and that's what happened. So, no, yeah. my my son, his name was Daryl Dwayne, but I never called him Daryl Dwayne. I always called him Dee Dee. And uh, it was confusing to his wife because we would always call him Dee Dee, and she calls him Dwayne. And he told me years later he never liked the name Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, I hope that uh, in some of those pictures we got a picture of the Church of God in Christ. And you probably have passed that sign many, many times, Taylor Boy. But it just came off this week, last week. Mm -hmm. And it was just going to be a 
non-denominational. It's going to be well, it's, it's, it's changed to Life Change and Ministries, um, LCM. And that, that is in the family with the non-denominational churches, which I had never heard of that until I got grown. I didn't know it was churches that say non-denominational. And the Lawson family will not be part uh, of the yeah, church. Yeah, they are part of it. They, they are because the son, um, James Otis Lawson, is legal heir to the building and the land. And so he, the new church is under his, uh, he's with Trinity Word of Faith. And so this new church is like under his guidance or whatever. But he is a bishop and he is now, he is a pastor of a non-denominational church, even though he was raised Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. But he elected to have that Lawson took off because it identified with the Church of God Christ so strong because it had been there so long that he wanted that to come. Yeah, he moving, wanted Lawson moving Temple forward to, so that people wouldn't be they wouldn't confused think on this is not the same church that was there previously. Denomination. So that, he, yeah. he didn't want people just stopping by thinking they were coming into a Pentecostal church and it's a non-denominational mm -hmm. church. One thing, the Pentecostal church, women didn't wear pants for years, they, and they still don't and it had never been approved by the board, uh, the bishop uh, and the board, never approved for women to wear pants. So our, our church didn't allow women no, to wear pants in church. It's part of, part of the church. doctrine, the yeah. church. You didn't wear pants in yeah. church. And my mother never wore pants. And we didn't wear pants to church. And I, my kids didn't wear pants to church. And now you go to some churches and all the women got on pants and pants suits. And some of them, you know, you know, it just looks so manly because we were so used to uh, women in skirts and dresses. And they had to be a certain length. You know, mama never would hand you a scarf if you didn't wear short skirts to church. Mm -hmm. You didn't have your arms out, short, no sleeves. And some people have on sundresses. And it just changed down through the years. Mm -hmm. so. and, that, and, you know, you were asking uh, what did a church mother uh, do? And that was one of the things that the church mother did was uh, to give instruction and guidance and, and help on, uh, as a woman, how you're supposed to sit, sit. Yes. Uh, the, the length of your clothing, um, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable and stuff. And because some of the scriptures in the Bible, uh, they took them literal about not being a tempter and, and that type of thing. So that's what the church mother did. Well, if you look at the women that be on TV now that's, say, interviewing or talking to somebody, and they cross their leg and the skirt's way up, you see they leg all the way up, almost to the panties. You know, go out to goodness, you know, they ain't Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. They wasn't raised that way. And, you know, and they would have speakers come in to, uh, teach uh, even the young girls as well as the the women um, how to sit, you know, on the pew and stuff, you know, where your legs not gapped open and all that that kind of stuff. So it was a teaching training uh, that the church mother would do. And I have been to churches that they need that training because some of these girls, you know, they wear the skirts are so short. At school, even it got so bad. Mr. Gordon had changed that they could were a certain length. The skirt had to be a certain length because it was just so short anymore. And now you can't tell the teachers if they, sometime when they come to me by stuff and I say, well, are you a student or a teacher? Because they're dressed just like the students. Mm -hmm. And they wear young stuff, and backs all out, and sundresses and, you know, and hide the, the way above the knee. And, you know, some jobs, you it was like that. When I first went to work at OSU, you could wear pants, but you had to have a jacket on with it, and it had to come to your hip. The jacket had to be on. That was a rule up at OSU. And that's and you could wear pants, but that jacket, you had to have a jacket, and the jacket had to come down slump. And those women wore it like that for a long time. And that would have been what time period? I'm trying to 
Uh, I think I went to work up there like in, I know it was in the 60s. I had all the kids. So it would have been probably, and then you retired what year? I, I retired, oh, you know, I just was looking at that. I don't know what year it was, but I was looking at my retirement picture. I didn't bring any of them, but because it was in, in the eighties or nineties. Well, I'd been there twenty-five years, and I probably went to work there when I was in my twenties. I was fifty-two when I retired, and I was so born in forty-one. So you can subtract that. that. I can figure that out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I was born in forty-one, and I and I retired. I was fifty-two. Well, it sounds like you've had a very good life. I've had a good life. So. I tell my kids I'm on my way out of here, but they don't like she, it. She says that, and I tell her all the time, you need to quit saying that because we are all on our way out of here. We're just on borrowed time, and we can't go anywhere but that I, God says. Yeah, I know it, but when you get to be 76, which is what I am, next, if I live the next month, I'd be 77. When you get to be that age, you have lived three scores and ten. And, I, and if I you live a good life, it's promised to you. Three, not everybody. And I don't. Lives long. I don't pay any not attention to her now. saying that because uh, the woman that was the last church mother at Boston Temple Church of God in Christ, she's ninety-one, coming up on ninety-two in February, so, she you know, I, I try to tell my mom. You know, yeah, so. but if you live three scores and ten, because that's, that's, the Bible gives you that. But, by but, reason but, of, but it, it also but says. But you can die but, as a baby, as right, a teenager, right, as a young right. adult. But yeah. if you do live here and stay here like I have, and you have met three scores and ten, I've been here, 70 would have been here. And I'm 76, and people do live to 90, 92, mm -hmm. and people are living longer because of the eating. But if the food go back to like it is now, you can eat anything in any season. They don't need food in by seasons. There were times if you wanted a strawberry, you had to wait till summertime to get a strawberry. You you couldn't go in Walmart and get a thing of strawberries at any time. You ate food in seasons because you were growing most of it yourself. Mm -hmm. And so food wasn't just handy at all times. At any time, you could just get whatever you wanted. No, you could not. And then kids eat different. They, they don't, people as a germ don't eat breakfast just like they used to. You know, we had a bowl of rice and a bowl of oatmeal. Or, you know, people don't, my kids don't eat, some of them don't even eat oatmeal now. They did when they were growing up, but we ate, and we ate what was there. Mm -hmm. But I don't even know if they had, did we even have commodities when y'all were growing up? Yes. Because, you know, you yes, guys we did. had some bunch of it. Cheese, you say, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, cheese. Uh -huh. I used yeah. to take mine over there at King's Grocery Store. Can you remember when King? It was a grocery store over there on Main Street across from Gittin Gallup. For years, it was King's Grocery. I used to take my thing of cheese in there and then have slice it. Because you couldn't slice it at home. You could get halfway and then it would break. <laughs> so I would take mine in there. And the, the butcher, the young one, would look like, and he would turn around and talk to me and he would tell him, put it on there and slice it up. And they would slice my cheese up for me. <laughs> and wouldn't charge me, and I would take it home, all sliced up. Because you just couldn't slice it at home with a knife. Mm -hmm. And my auntie would go down there, and they would save bananas for her, and they would ask me when I'm going there sometime, tell Miss Rosalie to come, we got bananas. And she would make banana nut bread, and she would always make loaves for them and loaves for her, and take, take it. They would save the bananas when they would get too ripe for her to make banana bread. That sounds good. People just knew people, you know. Every everybody knew. We had a store in town called W and W that was up on Eighth. Can you remember a store up there called right off of Eighth and Monroe? It was there for years. Mm -hmm. 
Then it became the church years later. Yeah. Well, it seems like when I say something, you know, I've been here so long, that, which I have, because I've lived here most of my life. I've lived in other states, but still was basically home. Mm-hmm. I lived in Texas when I met my husband. It rained every morning. <laughs> every morning it rained. We were like 30 miles from Houston, 30 miles from Beaumont, and we were in the middle, about 10 miles from Liberty, the big town. But it was, I couldn't wait to get back to Stillwater because I didn't eat seafood, and they all, they were seafood eaters, and they were right there on the ocean. You know, we'd go to the, uh, go down and meet the shrimp boat. Oysters, I didn't even know how to cook oysters. I don't know, what are you talking about? I didn't cook oysters. I couldn't hardly stand to touch one. But I did learn how to put it in dress and mesh my put it in dress. I learned how to do stuff as I was married a while. Mm-hmm. But I never could eat a lot of that. You know, I couldn't eat anything they would say. They they go crabbing and they would say, You really don't eat the dead meat. I ain't need nothing I gotta watch to see what's dead on and what ain't. Why would the dead meat be on these crabs? You know, it's like, you know? And the way they would catch them, and it would rain, and the water would come up in some yards, and people would be out there with strings, just standing in a hole, and they're catching the, uh, they they not shrimp, but what they call them, the, the little bitty ones. The crawdads is on the island. We call them crawdads here. They call them crawfish. We used to play with them here in Stillwater. We called them crawdads. And my dad said, you know, we used to eat those in Mississippi. And we, I didn't know what he was talking about until I went down to Texas. And they buy those things out of big bucket hoods and put them in something that looked like a hot water tank. And they put them in there and set them, put them down in there. And they put potatoes in with it and corn. Oh, that stuff is so good. The corn and potatoes. I never knew how to peel them. My husband would peel them for me. The little, the little crawfish. <laughs> but that wasn't, that wasn't my thing. And the crab, I was like, I ain't, who, where's the dead meat at on it? You know, <laughs> God, see, who ever heard of that? Have you ever been down and heard that term? <laughs> I think I'd pass on it too. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like, <laughs> well, like, well, you know, she's from Oklahoma. Well, I, I don't know nobody from here that was even, I brought some home so Mama could see what they look like. Pretty big blue ones that out right out of the ocean, you know. And they boil them, put them in water, boil them, and then they they pull off the legs and, you know, they crack them. They have a cracker. By the time you get through with all that work, oh you're God. not hungry. <laughs> yeah, we're going to meet the shrimp boat. No, I was like, oh my goodness. No. no where's Taco Bell? Or- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we didn't have all those fast food places. Dr. Emdy's family had a hamburger stand right where Gideon Gallup is at. And we would walk up there to get a hamburger stop by there sometime. But the main one was where Leonard's Jewelry Store used to be over there. What is that? Uh, First Bank is right across the street. Leonard's Jewelry Store used to be right in there. And they had a they had a son named Curtis that uh, hit his head out of Yokes Lake on the diving board and died years ago. And her son, my son was named Curtis and her son was named Curtis. She'd always talk to me. Yeah, Leonard's Jewelry Store. Now they're on Main Street, but it's called something else. I don't think it's Leonard's, it's called something else. Kizzy's or something funny. Yeah. But I've been here a long time. You've done good. Yes, and we've been here. So. Yeah, I'm glad you consider Stillwater home and you came to see us today. It is home, and I hope you do get that old video where people that's in other states can go in and pull it up and maybe see they sell. Because yep. you've got a lot of pictures of Washington School. Wow. Getting some, getting some, but yeah. Well, we appreciate you sharing today. It's been great. Yeah. Thank you.